Hi, this is Jeff Reddy from Vidnack Television, and we're here tonight for a very special interview that was literally years in the making. Um, in the late 70s, we find our guests tonight uh, bashing it out here around Cleveland and various clubs, and one of the original punk bands here in America, not the Sex Pistols, not the Clash, but the Dead Boys. Cheetah Chrome, welcome. Hello, folks. So, first off, let's talk a little bit about the tour. Okay. So you're out touring for the 40th anniversary of the debut album Young Hog and Snotty. Uh, so why did you decide to put a new Dead Boys band together? Who's in the band and how was the tour? Well, we were uh, doing, uh, doing a lot of uh, Cheetah Crow solo gigs. And it was kind of you know, was building momentum. And um, Angie, my guitar player, mentioned, well, you know, this is the 40th anniversary of the album. I was like, oh, well, we should do something to celebrate. And uh, what we were talking about, uh, there's a business deal that I can't talk about. There was another label bought the rights from Warner, Warner Brothers. And I was supposed to be working with them on a box set. Well, Warner Brothers decided to drag their feet so they could put out that knockoff on Ryan Vinyl, you know, on Rhino record. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, you know, that's not going to happen. So I'm going to special. So we came up with that deal that we had not, we, we, we recorded the original album. Uh, we were told it was going to be only a demo. And then we were told, oh, no, we're going to put it out like it is. You know, which, when we came out, you know, we grew up. We were, you know, I was a man, but I'd be able to go back and you know, do it. And, uh, you know, Kenji's production was great. She did a lot more than she had. But there's little things that bugged us with my guitar sound on the whole record bug me, you know. So we decided to go back in and see what it might have sounded like. We had the opportunity back then, you know, and uh, the other guys in the band can't make it for the reason, so we're all, uh, we got to Jay the singer, we found him in California, and uh, he's worked out great, just the best to do ever, you know, and he's a good singer in his own right, but he's just using his own voice, but he's a mind of her singer, you know, and uh, it seems like a good thing to do, so. I own the name that voice, so I knew it. And I uh, decided to do What's it like playing all the old songs again? It's fucking great. It's a, it's, you know, I'm a kid again. You um, started out with rock tunes. Yeah. And uh, back in your early 70s with uh, Johnny and with uh, Peter Lochner and David Thomas. Yes. And Craig Bell. Craig Bell. Um, now, long ago, I heard that Stiv had joined the band toward the end. Yeah. Uh, but I heard that there was always a lot of tension well, there. The thing was back then, you know, David, David's voice, not just back then, now, I mean, he has a very unique voice. And I love it. I think he's like always a rock plant. I think his voice is like an instrument, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, Johnny and Peter were both kind of like, you know, he can't sing, he can't sing, you know? And I, I disagree totally. And, um, Johnny left him, but he you know, because he wanted a problematic relationship with Johnny. Peter uh, was just confused and I was uh, thought we should be getting way more out of you know out of the band than we were, you know, as far as becoming bigger than you know Cleveland. Um, and he was a pretty tortured soul too. I yeah, guess. yeah. But uh Stiv joined we had met the Piccadilly, Peter introduced me to him, and uh, he, he came up and did a couple of rehearsals with us, and I said, you know, he doesn't work in this band. And, he was and David got devoted to like playing keyboards and saxophone, which, you know, at the time was pretty cruel to do him. I really was, I regret that that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, with that plan of the seas of rockets, you know, where the rock set in, and, uh, so we had to move on from there. And I just wanted to see it through the end. And once I did that, I was happy. But Stu and Johnny were both waiting in the wings. Rocks broke up on one Saturday, we were rehearsing the next Saturday. You know? yeah. Well, in his liner notes to the Eve of the Dead Boys Frankenstein EP, uh, Jeff Magnum had mentioned that you, Stu, Jimmy, and him wanted to put together a band. And that became Frankenstein. Yeah. So how did that come about and then how did that morph into the Dead Boys because Jeff left and you were only a 
for peace yeah. with them. Well, we, um, we met Jeff, uh, who's Vlad Hazlock, we used to write the ring. Um, you know, he fit right in with us, and we uh, needed a bass player, so we did this, it was Frankenstein. Frankenstein, you know, pretty much died the same death as the Dead Boys did, except sooner. And we only did three gigs, and, you know, people just, you know, now I realize they didn't, they were just shocked at what they were seeing. You know, they were a lot better than, you know, they thought we were going to be, and, you know, it kind of shook them, I guess, but, um, well, it wasn't something that they were used to so, hearing. Yeah, but it was like, if we stopped playing, there would be silence. People go, you know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, they hate us. They, they just want us gone, you know? <laughs> so we gave up out of frustration. And then we still made the trip up to New York and met, you know, hooked up with Joey Remote. We had met him in Youngstown. I still went up to actually visit him again, you know? Uh, and he came back and had his medicine in the airport. He goes, you know, guys, uh, there's people like us in New York. We don't fit in here, we fit in there, you know? And so we all jumped in the van and uh, went to New York and, you know, snowballed from there. I've always wondered what would have happened if Rocky had jumped in the van and gone, you know? Were, were you trying to come across as like a sort of a cross between the Stooges and the Ramones? No, we were trying to be Aerosmith, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously? No, but I mean, we were, um, you know, we were, very, we more like a Rolling Stones kind of thing, but we had that attitude, you know. Um, you know, rock and roll was, was just getting too stuffy and um, losing a sense of humor, you know, as far as we were concerned. So we, uh, that was kind of what was the catalyst to get us to do that. Would you consider the Dead Boys as being one of the only really true punk bands at that time? I mean, I know there was the Voidoids and, and Richard Howell and his groups and the Heartbreakers and stuff. Oh, but yeah. The Dead Boys were different. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we wouldn't label punk. I mean, we, we thought of ourselves more like the Ipsy Five or something, you know. Um, the, uh, Garage. Hmm? Garage. Yeah, you know. But, uh, you know, we were, we were good musicians. You know, a lot of the punk bands were just weren't good musicians. <laughs> well, we know that Stiv was very influenced by Iggy and, yeah. of course, the famous incident in the Cincinnati Pop Festival yeah. in 1968 where Iggy gave Iggy the peanut butter. Right. Iggy smeared it all over himself. And Stiv told us in 86, um, when, when we interviewed him, that he looked into Iggy's eyes and there was like this transference of energy there. And he said that Iggy said the same thing. Shit. I know he did. I know okay. he did. I, I know. I know. Uh, but but he said that Iggy told him that he got the same thing from Morris, and so there was kind of like that six degrees of separation. Like it very well, be. Uh, well, with the peanut butter, uh, I, I, was, I was about 13 back in uh, 69 or 70, the uh, rock festival, and Iggy dived on top of us. And I've been trying to explain to people what Iggy and the Stooges were like, because uh, they've only played Detroit, and it's his first time outside the city. And somebody had a picnic basket, and that's just about, once he smeared that peanut butter, gave him peanut butter, he smeared it on himself. And then back then, like, no one did that. They're going, nah. So anyway, they come out, and they got swastikas draped over their amps. And he's just wearing nothing but uh, silver lame pants and these black gloves. And he's diving on the audience. But uh, Iggy dove on our shoulders, and we were holding him up, and this kid tapped me on his shoulder, and he had the peanut butter. So I handed it to Iggy. He looked down and smeared it on himself. And that's when I decided to be a singer. It's sort of, uh, you know those things in Marvel Comics, sort of when the kid becomes a superhero, he's just some ordinary kid, and all of a sudden something wham happens, and uh, it changes his life. Well, when I looked at Iggy, and when he looked at my eyes about the peanut butter, it's like, it's hard to describe. Like it's a transference of power? Yeah, it sounds sort of like real hokey, and, but it was very, very cartoonish, and, and it was like sort of an enlightenment or a passing of something. Like the father to the son. It, it, it's the eyes. And it seemed like all time stopped. There was no sound. Just a contact with the eyes. And it seemed like an eternity, but a split second. And it seemed a light came from above or, it, or just some type of power. And it went from his eyes into mine. And after that, it just suddenly totally changed everything inside me. And I wanted to sing. And it's, in a way, I think, he transported part of his soul and put it inside me. Or the demon that he was being driven by came inside me. 
which you can do with transference with the eyes because uh, that's uh, sort of the key to all uh, transcendental soul. Sound like a hippie. Was that link? Yeah. And uh, the same thing happened with Mike Monroe from Hanoi Rocks. He was uh, 19 and tripping in uh, Scandinavia in Stockholm. And he had no idea to be a singer at that time. And he went into a record store and saw my solo album. And he looked at the eyes on my solo album. And it, he felt the same thing. And uh, we had never really, I never told him about that. And he told me about how it affected him. So I told him about Iggy. And Iggy remembered it. So it's, in a way, it's like, and Iggy got that from Jim Morrison the first time he went to the whiskey. Uh, he, Jim Morrison's on stage, and Morrison looked directly at him, and he felt the same thing happen. So I guess there is this sort of communication or transference of this attitude or this fire or these demons. Yeah, well, it's like you can you can bring up you can unleash the thing that's there somewhere in line by by the contact between the eyes. And and, and still, stage performance was very pop. I mean, there was no doubt that. Yeah, I don't there know. Was you know you, you, we all love the Stooges. You know, my guitar is very James Williams. You know, it was also very much Wayne Kramer and Fred Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of Alvin Lee's going in there, but. Um, but wasn't Stephen a blues band at that time too, or doing something? No, no he was. He said that he was playing the blues band. He was like, I guess. He's sick as no blues singer. I hope wasn't afraid. Oh, I know he was. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> wasn't. Blues band. He definitely wasn't. But, uh, uh, but uh, in, in any case, um, so the last time we interviewed Joey, um, as you referenced, you know, coming up to New York and everything, yeah. he said that he suggested to Stiv that you guys all come up there, and Stiv invited him up to the party up here in Cleveland. Yeah. They followed you guys, and Stiv did his famous surfing trick on the freeway on the way up well, that's there. That was the first time we met the Ramones. We met them, they played the Tomorrow Club, we had a Youngstown. We all went down to that. And they needed to get to the highway, so he said, follow us. And um, so we followed, you know, they followed us. And the next thing I know, Stiv's going, hold the wheel. And, you know, he's out on the roof, you know, with his butt out, you know, which just happened way more. It's amazing he didn't get killed, because, you know, the law of averages was against him. But, I, I witnessed you know, that myself. Was there like, was a time in, in, in 1980, he was in town, the Dickies yeah. were playing. And um, after the show was over, we all went over to Chung Wa. Yeah. And on the way back, he did that. Yeah. And he, we were following behind him. And, yeah. thought it was bizarre. And then later I found out that that was your indoctrination into the club more or less. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, once Stiff showed you his ass, you were accepted. Yeah, it was like, much, you know? that was pretty cool. But um, what what can you tell us about his early days and his influences and how he brought that to you? How it was it a Catholic all... boy. I mean, it, ours, his was pretty similar to any of ours. We, uh, all five dead boys were, we were um, also boys. And you know, we were all raised, uh, you know, in religious families. Like, you know, my great grandmother came straight off the boat from Ireland, and so you know, if I ever have a priest coming in, same priest that did mass and, you know, when I was our, at our school, he used to come in every Friday, give her communion, and she had this little shrine set up and all that, you know. I'd open the door and he'd be stink stinking the bush mills at eight in the morning, and you know, it was. <laughs> You know, no, Stiv always joked about his being an altar boy. Yeah. It led him. Oh, there's a picture. There's a picture. It's so classic. I wish I could find it. It's him standing between two nuns, right? And he's going, like that. <laughs> I mean, give that classic Steve Stiv sneer. You can't be more in love as well. It's good with you. And the next thing we know, I don't want to be no Catholic boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was, let's, let's go back to 1974. What was the music scene like here in Cleveland? When I interviewed David Thomas, I mentioned the fact that I felt like there was a lot of squalor and, you know, dirtiness around him, no jobs or anything, yeah. but but he didn't agree with that. He didn't see it as being squalor, but more as a creative force. Gee, how do you do, how do I argue with David or something like that? You know? <laughs> well, so, how did you guys view it? Why well, your the thing is like, you know, him, him and the... Uh, People all moved into the Plaza Hotel back then. They're calling themselves urban pioneers, and it's like they're talking about you're an urban pioneer. You have got an apartment in places where I've been riding my bike since I was seven. You know, the Uber house. No, you had to go to the Palace on 30th. You know? Oh, okay. And I mean, me and my me and my buddies used to 
run for projects, we run our bikes out all through downtown, you know. We're like eight, seven, eight years old. And you know, we didn't consider ourselves urban pioneers, but you know, we were hell of a pioneering those rich kids moving into the city. Yeah, right. You know? And how did how did the, the scene here translate into what you guys developed in New York? Well, the, the cool thing is that the uh, plaza, even though it's a little pretentious to be calling it urban pioneering, uh, it was a bunch of creative people all living in one building. And uh, a lot of good ideas there. And uh, that's how it just kind of naturally progressed uh, into what became Peru, became the Bed Boys, became Ch uh, Chai Pig, became a whole bunch of different things. Um, I'm glad you mentioned them. They were one of the great bands out of the band. Yeah, Chai Pig was a good band. And uh, you know, Jim Jones used to be the guy at Record Attic who sold us all, got the hottest records. Always put five copies aside for friends, you know. The great Jim Jones, yeah. rest his soul. So, and all these people, so you know, we're just the, the Cleveland back then. I mean, at the time, it sucked. Like it was just, you know, the river caught on fire. You know, and it stunk bad. All the buildings were really gray. And, you know, it was um, not to me not a creative force at all. The only thing that created in me was a desire to get the fuck out of there. You know? It doesn't. It doesn't seem to me as though there were really any particular messages in Dead Boy songs, for a couple of exceptions, no, Third mean, Generation Nation. Yeah, which I mean, that was kind of, yeah, I don't know what the fuck talking about. <laughs> um, uh, Ain't Nothing to Do was a good one. Um, you know, uh, I wish we would have been a little bit more political than we were. Um, but he saved that for the Lord, you know? Right. Well, at that time in the, in the States, I mean, there wasn't really much in the way of political activism going on. Not like there was yeah. over in England. We didn't yeah. have the things yeah. to rebel against that they had there, the poverty and the lack yeah. of jobs well, I mean, and things as bad as they did in England. You so, know, you think about you know, Cleveland back then, we were very much like a place like Manchester or Birmingham or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, like Sheffield. Like, it, was a, it was a total gray, smoky, dirty town, you know? Uh, I heard that um, that Johnny Thunders was one of the people that gave Stim a lot of inspiration and things. Oh, him and me both. I mean, we both thought the Thunders were great. And then Joey said that it was him that pretty much got you guys the gig in Hilly. Yeah, he lied to Hilly and said he, that we had played with him. <laughs> We'd opened for him at that show mm -hmm. in Youngstown. And he goes, man, you got to get these guys a date. you got to get these guys a date. And Hilly bought it. So we were able to just skip a you know, a audition night and go play our own night. And, um, you know, Joey also got like Danny Fields, John Holmes from Legs and Neil, Roberta Bailey, all these people were very influential to the gig. And we got a lot of attention from them. You know? So at that time, you guys were living in Cleveland, driving up to New York, playing a gig, turning around, no and coming back player. home no with no bass player, player. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and how, how how was that? I mean, that had to leave a lot of tension between you guys driving back and forth like that. Well, you know, we got used to it pretty quick. I mean, one of the best stories about that is we had a, we got a, a really short notice gig, like on a Wednesday. He only wants you to play Friday and Saturday. You know, it was our first two night run in New York. And I was like, oh shit, we gotta do it. We don't have any money to get it car or anything to get the gear up there, right? So still has his room, roommate on bar with that bitch to use the keys for a car so he could go do the laundry, right? So we go get the car and he goes, like, where are we going? Where are you going? He goes, where do you go get a trailer and put this up, put it on here and go to New York? <laughs> and he calls him from like, Buck, like Buckhorn, Pennsylvania, you know, but I'll bar, don't be pissed, but, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it was pretty good. It was one of our better moves. But um, yeah, we gave you that trip down I-80. I don't know how many times that was. So Stiff told us that um, eventually, when you did finally manage to get Jeff to move up to New York, yeah. that um, he didn't exactly have the best time. You guys were all in the crash pad. There were mattresses all oh, over the place. Boy, Susie yeah. had dead quarters, dead quarters. A, a lot of sex going yeah. on, screaming out in the Bowery. When um when the Dead Boys were here and they moved to New York and you were playing for Hilly and Seabees, tell me about that kind of story. Hilly and Seabees, uh, well, to put it in proper perspective, uh, I had more sex than the girls live there. That's the toilets. Thing. Uh, it was total insanity but it's like a magic that can never be repeated. The Ramones, Talking Heads, Blondie, uh, 
who else is around there? The dictators. Yeah. Uh, all of us lived in the heartbreakers, the thunders. All of us lived within a five-block radius, and nobody was big then. We all used to play the club, and no one would come down but the other bands and their girlfriends. And uh, back then, it was so poor, we'd have to live off hookers or strippers. Hey. That was the only place to live. So anyways, uh, it was a lot of fun then. And uh, slowly degenerated when all the uh, tunnel and bridge kids come over, and it got popular. Jersey, yeah, right. But uh, the best way to describe it was uh, Jeff Magnum, our bass player, wouldn't join us for a while, so we played a year without a bass player. When we started getting popular, Jeff decided to move to New York, and he's expecting this big flash place, CBGBs. We were loaded. I think we lived in his penthouse. Chelsea. Because we were telling him all this. Yeah. And uh, we uh, brought him up, and he saw CBGBs as dog shit everywhere. <laughs> it still and, is. And right above it's a uh, wine of crash pan. Yeah. And we'd be practicing in the afternoon, they'd be throwing bottles down on us because we're waking them up. And he's right on the Bowery, and he's starting to really get manic. We take him back to the hotel, our, our flat on East Night between First and A. We're the only white family living there, it was all Puerto Ricans. And uh, he wouldn't go out for two days because he kept hearing gunshots and people screaming. And he finally gets some sleep and wakes up because there's just mattresses everywhere. There's three rooms and nine guys living there. And he wakes up and he sees these two girls, Susie Headbanger from Ramon Song, mm -hmm. her and Kathy Curls. <laughs> but uh, he wakes up and it's about six in the morning, sunlight's coming in. He's watching these two girls eat each other out, and Zero's dressed mm -hmm. in his uh, Von Zero outfit, <laughs> his director, and he's whipping him with a uh, with a riding prop. And Jeff opens up, and looks at that, and says, "Jesus Christ, I'm in hell." And that was it. And that's the best way to describe it. Life in hell. Do you miss those days? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's sort of like missing hemorrhoids, you know. Only when you sit down. No, it was a great time, but, you know, it can't be repeated, and it's best for the man. So, anyways, it, it just progressed from there. Uh, Dead Boys, at the time, were the first American punk band, in the sense that Ramones had the sound, but not the style. And uh, when we cut our hair short, which we thought was going to be something totally unique, Sex Pistols come along, but we're the first American band to have the effect and the look of what later became punk. And uh, so from there, we became sort of the darlings of the media. So that's when the Stones and that started biting us around because they were intimidated by the new punk. They started to feel like old men. It, it always seemed to me at that time like there was three bands. Like it was the Dead Boys and Aerosmith and the Dolls. The Dolls sold, sold clothes, Aerosmith sold records, and you guys sold bandages. True. I got uh, taken to the hospital seven times in a row from the gigs with CBGBs. Flip my head open and come back so I can set bandage up. Or, uh, well, I still got some, uh, this is from the Dead Boys. This yeah. razor slash, yeah. This is our first, uh, anniversary and some girl slashing the razor. It's a present. It's like a lot different then. Everybody's into violence and, uh, and blood. The front row used to get razors and slash their arms and you'd autograph people's arms with razors. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. How, how did you manage to keep him there long enough to, to you know, like make it? Well, you know, Jeff, he said, I'll give, I'll give him this. He stuck it out there one time, and then he kept he quit, you know, all the time. And, uh, you know, Jeff's whole attitude was, well, oh, boy, I'll play if I look safe or whatever, you know? And you didn't fucking bad or not, you know? And um, so, Jeff, that's one of the reasons he's not here now. He's, because he never seemed to really want to be a dead boy to begin with. You know what I mean? He kept quitting, we kept going with no bass player, and we were supposed to have a bass player. And, you know, he's pissed off we don't do this tour, but guess what? You didn't play on the fucking record, dude. He didn't play on the first record. You know, uh, Bob Clermont played bass on it. So what he's supposed to do, he goes on a rant on Facebook for, about me and just giving, tearing me a new one. Finally, I didn't just answered and said, you know something, you rather. I'll use the damn shags base for it, you know? <laughs> well, that, that actually makes the whole story about the cover of that album even that much more poignant, because when Dave took it, that means that he took the actual photo of what was the band that wasn't the band on that album. Well, he, well he, 
Yeah, well, I mean, Jeff is the only one that was. I mean, we all, I, other people, we had Jeff, we just stuck yeah. him in there because he was every bass player. And, and yet they he had won. it reshot with him in there. He didn't play a note on it. That's, that's, what were, what were your first impressions when you first got to CPs? And well, I stepped in dog shit. For <laughs> six inches of walking in the door. And so I was like, oh, the story is true. You know, where, where can I clean my shoe off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how did Hilly, uh, like, cross to you guys? Hilly, you know, he's an old biker, so he was really cool. Um, he had his deep voice like God, you know, and, um, you know, so at first he was a little intimidated, plus he was huge, you know, he was like that, you know, tall. And, um, you know, first he seemed like it was hard to get a, not unapproachable, but, you know, after he sat down and had cold beers, he was a really nice guy. And he was the only one that put his, put his money where his mouth was when it comes to bidding on us to get us his management, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we had offers from several other people, and he's the first one that actually puts up some national patch. Well, the first place that people think of when they think of a punk club is CBGB. I mean, yeah. you know, Max's was around, Government Lounge was around, but CB's is the place that everybody thinks of. And oh, I yeah. have to think that it's because of Hilly and his vision. Oh, yeah, well, Hilly, 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 uh, yeah, he cared. Like, he really got into it. Once, uh, you know, once like bands like television, talking heads, and all that, really, he, he got behind the scenes. He liked to play. You know, he's a musician himself. He toured what, long enough for um, Roger Miller on the uh, what was the tour of the Road. That's pretty cool. Um, now you once likened the scene in New York at that time to the '60s, except instead of yeah. hippies, it was punks. Yeah. And I always said that the punks were the hippies of the '70s. Yeah, no, it was true. I mean, it's very true. And the um, you know the, the short hair. And all that, you know, it was, um, I don't know. Um, I didn't have long hair since I was 15. I don't know if I was in Alice Cooper when I was in high school, you know? And um, so it was kind of like, well, we should cut our hair, just get a new image, just so we can, you know, see what happens, you know? And so we did, and then, of course, we were accused of imitating the Sex Pistols. And that wasn't the place of how we would have had the fucking beat two hundred tires and forget how to play it. <laughs> and of course you were there before them anyway. So um, so what um, <laughs> let's let's briefly talk about the PP. Um, what did you think of Rupert Grint's portrayal of you and you playing the cabbie of all things <laughs> in driving around New York City in the C V G D movie? In a seventies uh, mint shirt that itched like crazy. <laughs> um, polyester is horrible, but um no, um, I first found out uh, Rupert was going to be playing me, um, and, I, and they told me, I said, oh, my God, to me, my kids were both being Harry Potter, Potter fans. So I knew exactly who he was, and I thought he was cool. You know, I thought, that's a perfect choice. I thought he did a great job. You know, too. and, um, you know, he, I never, he never called me to um, ask me about anything. Um, the staff of the product that you know, the place is dead yet. She called me and picked my brain over the phone. Um, you know, the directors all called me, and I was like, you know, an advisor on the thing, you know. But um, Rupert, I didn't meet him until we were there. We, we came to the studio, and he was filming a scene, playing guitar on stage. And um, did he actually play, or did they? No, yeah, he, he can't play. No, I guess he can now. I think he got inspired. I think he told me he was trying to play guitar. Oh, that's cool. See, so you're but, still yeah. inspiring people even all these years later. But he. Um, <laughs> You know, then we watched while he did his first scene of talking like I did, right? And I blew me away. He sounded exactly like me. And he had my walk down. I don't know where the hell he got all this from. He, he told me videos, but I mean, he, I don't know. He, he nailed it. He should have gotten an Oscar. He turned he was me, you know? Now, Stim and Johnny both said, or Stim and Jimmy rather, both said that they preferred playing in clubs. Was that your opinion too? Um, do you yeah, I do. Well, duh. <laughs> you know? Uh, let me see. Um, no, I do. I mean, you know, you know, ballrooms and you know, kinds of halls. I mean, it's nice. It's better, but um, the intimacy's in the clubs. Um, so I like. I do enjoy that a lot. You know, it's. I don't like when people are too far away. I don't like barriers between the front row and right on right there. You know. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, you know, playing clubs is. More enjoyable, you know, the stadium, I don't even ever want to play one. 
No, I could. I couldn't see you guys. Plus, I'm never going for to the Stones. Now, if you were opening for the Stones, and I could actually almost see them asking you to do that at one time. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you're friends with Keith anyway. Yeah. Um, I speaking of which, I haven't talked to him in fucking twenty years. Speaking of which, I wanted to ask you about the incident at his skating party where you broke your wrist. Yeah, yeah. Wrist. I can't picture Keith Richards on skates. He, oh, he wouldn't get on damn thing. He's just me, Mick Jagger, and Richard Lloyd. No, that must have been a lot yeah. of fun. And it was cool to me and me and there's a Mick and Jerry Hall and me and Richard Lloyd we were all like you know racing, get our truck, getting our you know, thing together, and I hadn't skated this for years, you know, and uh, went to make a corner, and one leg went this way, one leg went that way, and I broke my fall up my wrist, and I just, you know. That must have been pretty hell when I'm trying to play guitar after that. Well, I was in, for six weeks I was in a cast, but it was pretty cool, because, uh, you know, Keith hooked me up with a few good drugs and let me use a limo to get to the hospital, so. <laughs> So, <laughs> so as, as, as we said, you're touring for the 40th anniversary of Young Loud and yes. Sonic, so um, let's talk about the recording of the album. You at one point had said that you weren't happy with it, and so you remixed it as Younger, Louder, and Snottier. Do you still hold by that, or are you, has it grown was, enough on you now? Well, that, that was something that, that record was something that we just did one night with Bob Clearmount, uh, because it had everything on it. Um, there was a lot of stuff to... You know, we used a fuzz box on some stuff, and it just didn't fucking sound right. And Bob did this mix, it pretty much had everything on it. It was like a steak with another fat cut off, you know? And Stim put that out because he thought, you know, it'd be a good thing to, you know, dock. Um, to me, I think the more legit one now would be what I just got done doing with these guys, you know? Because it's more, we went and recorded it the way I heard it in my head, not just mixed it. So for the second album, the uh, We Have Come For Your Children, um, you went to Florida to record that with Felix Papillardi. Yeah. Um, now, Hilly supposedly said that the reason that he wanted you to go there to record was because you'd be too drunk if you stayed in New York. Is there any truth to that? Yeah. <laughs> That's totally true, but I mean, he didn't have to go that far. Oh, you know, he could have to record in New Jersey or something. I mean, <laughs> We didn't belong in Miami. It was just not our scene. Uh, it was there for like six weeks. I mean, two weeks doing uh, pre-production rehearsals and another month recording. We were all like, well, this should take us a week, you know? Well, I know you wanted to play it live like you would on stage yeah. anyway, and you didn't. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted it to be a live album, you know? But um, it was, was it like hanging out with the meeting like the Bee Gees and all that? Who well, the Bee Gees right, right down great. The, Right down the hall yeah. from you guys. Well, I mean, the first time I met any of them was when I went into the lounge to get a beer, and Andy Gibbs was there sitting there smoking a joint. And, you know, hey, man, you want to just come here and get a beer and start talking. And just hit it off really good, you know. And so he became my little smoke buddy. He'd come in and check on, you know, when are you going to see the freak? He's okay, we'll do this, you know. And, um, we go out there and, you know, hey, smoke joint, do a couple lines, whatever, and um, go back in. And then the brothers, we come in and visit us all the time, you know, we got, and they hated disco. You know, they didn't like what they were doing, but it was making money, it was keeping their career alive. And uh, they reminisced about the 60s and, you know, the songs back then. And they really did some groundbreaking work. They did more groundbreaking with the Mellotron than anybody. Yeah. You know, and um, they were just all super nice guys. And, um, you know, I love so I love hanging out with them. And, you know, it was a, I was a Bee Gees fan, you know, I didn't like the new stuff, but I got the old stuff. You know, I'm yeah, their 60s stuff was really, you know, 1914 yeah. mining disaster. Yeah, you know, the first three albums was great, you know. Yeah. What, did, did Sire Records want to change the direction for the band? Because We've Come For Your Children isn't as raw as Young Lock and Snotty is. I don't know, but, you know, there's one of the things that the, the Bee Gees had, and they had it in their studio, they actually had their own studio built on the Criteria. And um, they had one of the first automated boards in the country. And so you go to the and they did it themselves. It wasn't it did perfect, but it got, it got you right in the neighborhood with a rough mix, you know? And I strongly suspect that's who mixed our record. You know, I don't think it was, I think Felix probably, you know, says to go, and he went home for a couple hours and came back and said, okay, it's done. You know, um, cause it doesn't sound, I mean, anybody with ears can tell it's a tiny piece of shit. There's no tone whatsoever on it, if you ask me. Uh, it's no, no EQ. 
And the songs were good, we played them good, and uh, live, they were thunderous. And it was just a huge disappointment to me when that record came out. I mean, I just wanted to go put a bigger bag on my head and play gigs. You know? And Catholic Wine, Son of Sam, yeah. are classics. Yeah, but not on that record. No, we had these freaking dog barks and stun shots, and it was like, you know. Um, was there much of an impact um, on the band? Uh, when, when you did the series of shows, there were six shows in L.A. at the Whiskey in 1980. Oh, um, man. Oh, you had already left the band. Yeah, okay. I already left the band. Why, had, why was that then? Why did well, you, you asked me about Sire Records. So we get called back from tour. Um, find, we told that the rest of the tour is canceled. And that if we wanted to remain on Sire Records, we would have to change our, um, our image, our music, possibly the name of the band. And one member actually went, no, what do you mean, Seymour? And I just looked at him and said, you're actually expressing interest in this bullshit? Then you got to find yourself another fucking guitar player. And I walked out the door, and um, that was the end of the Dead Boys. You know, um, so they decided to go on uh, with the Magic Suit Dead Boys, you know. And Stiff called me a few times and asked me, oh, no, man, you have to be you, man. I said, well, I would, but they don't, they don't make a suit like that in my size. <laughs> they just don't, you know? And, uh, well, you guys did um, some garage tunes during you yeah. know your live sets and on the on the yeah. records. You did Hey Little Girl and Tell Me. Uh, so when Stiff released Disconnected, uh, which had a lot of that kind of sound yeah. on it, was that something? Was he trying to bring that to the band? Were you trying to go sort of in that direction a little bit? Stiff and Jimmy were trying to take it more power pop, and um, you know I wasn't into it. I'm not a pretty boy. I don't want to go out there and just, you know, wink at the girls and crap like that. I want to go out there and play my guitar and kick ass. And so there was definitely a, you know, a, a, a shift there, a little sea change, you know, in the direction. Um, you know, personally, I think if we would have hung together and told Syra to fuck off, you know, fire us, and gone to another label, you know, we would have been fine. Yeah, because you were only really around but for three were, years. But when Johnny got stabbed, that kind of took the wind out of our sails and everybody kind of drifted apart. And, oh, when we got back together, the, the rod is set in. I mean, you know, was a, some of us developed drug problems, some of us had other problems, and it uh, just didn't gel. It wasn't, it wasn't the five of us against the world that it was when we started out. How did you How did you feel about the disconnected album? I thought it was good. I thought it wasn't I, because it was making my cup of tea. It was good. You know, I think they did a great job. Um, you know, still deserving success for that. Did he ever bring any of those songs to the Dead Boys and say, can we do these? It's cold outside was the one that he really wanted to do. We, really want, we would have done it, but it would have sounded just like Tell Me, you know? And it was basically the same song, you know? Yeah. Matter of fact, I Tell Me, I still solo from It's Cold Outside. <laughs> Many people don't catch that. I'm going to have to listen to that again. So again, I play the song, I play the thing, 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 thing. Yeah, I just tried doing the right. Okay, that works. That works. <laughs> so when he went to London, um, he got together with Dave Trigunner from Champ 69. Yeah. And he put out The Wanderers, Only Lovers Left Alive. <laughs> Which was a brilliant piece of work. I thought so too. It was, I, I wish it was more than just a one-off. But Yeah, um, no, that was, that was at the time, it, it, was, it was just really a breath of fresh air. I loved it. I was so proud of him. It was very political. I was so proud of him. He was, he was he was getting into a very heavy political period yeah. at that point of his life. Stop writing. Like, we we also got, you wrote dick songs. I used to tell him. You know, but um, no, so you wait till you quit the band, then you start getting political. I've been asking you to do for two years. Then I interviewed him in '82. Yeah. He was talking about the whole situation in Grenada. And yeah, oh no, he was very much else. into it. You know, he got me into it. You know, and. Uh, I always thought that you know, what we were going up against uh, in the 70s, when um, Ronald Reagan you know, was running the president, you know, there was a lot to be said, you know, and he didn't want, he didn't want to touch it then. Yeah, he was, he, that he could definitely be outspoken later, that's yeah. for sure. So, obviously, there were a number of Dead Boys reunions you participated in, some of them. Um, was there ever any talk of actually getting it back together again as a permanent? Oh, we tried. We were doomed. It, you know, yeah, it was plenty of times. But uh, we were like the you know, unsung hero. Uh, you know, the 
good hit of stuff show of rock and roll. <laughs> At that point, we didn't know, um, you know, nobody wanted us. You know, we were the book the black halo over our heads, you know. So, so in '86, um, Stiff told us that um, he, when he met Sid and Nancy, um, Dean Ramon had given him a knife that where double O seven in the back, yeah. and. Sid and Nancy wanted one really bad. And yep. We went on a shopping expedition to Times Square. And they were both so screwed up that like I mean, they literally one time she got this big roll of money on the on the street. And we all had to go run and grab it. Like, Let's just see your first, love your first. And all of a sudden we had a crowd ball of like Times Square, you know, dude near the wells on the steel that knew we had a whole bunch of money. And you know, and meanwhile they're staggering along. It's you know, it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, we were with Tell me about uh, being yeah. next door to uh, neighbors to Sid and Nancy. Uh, I'd read in Cream magazine that the uh, Sex Pistols uh, uh, hated us. They asked Sid, "Is there anybody you'd like to kill?" And he says, "Yeah, it's too bad." Just what he said about Johnny Rotten. And I uh, only told the truth that he's fagging. And uh, so Sid threatened to kill me. And I heard he was in New York, and I, we were playing CBGBs that night, and I told uh, our one roadie if uh, Sid jumps on stage to fight me, don't beat him up or throw him off, because then you know, he could always say, oh, it's still pussy out, you know, and his mind is getting me. And uh, our roadie says, well, what's Sid look like? Because our roadie is real intelligent. And I says, well, he sort of looks like, and I'm describing him, and I says, sort of looks like this guy coming down the street, and here's Sid and Nancy walking into Chelsea, and I says, hang out because Sid's big, you know. Right. And uh, I turned around and said, good morning, Sidney. And they went, are you Stiv? I said, yeah. Why don't you come up to our hotel room? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, all right, start walking and Nancy goes first. And Sid says, go ahead. I said, no, you go first. Because he's real notorious for chaining people from the back. I said, no, you first. He says, did the two of you like to fight? Or, yeah. And I says, yeah, the two of you still after me? I said, no, you can't put his arm around me. And, we came back to friends. Yeah. Uh, he was living on the first floor, and he fell asleep and burnt the room down. So they moved him up to the 12th floor, right next to me. And we became real good friends. For three months, he'd been after me to buy him this knife that D.D. Ramon gave me. Sort of like the best street knife, this 007 yeah. butt knife mm -hmm. that you carry in the back. So I took Sid and uh, Nancy up uh, that afternoon to get some knives in Times Square. They each bought one. and. Uh, the difference between the two is they have leather thongs in it. I took Sid's out and showed him how to carry it. Nancy kept hers in. And uh, we went back to the hotel. And that night we had a fly to play Cleveland. And I guess what was happening was uh, Sid was on the methadone program. Him and Nancy go get their fix, buy some heroin, shoot up two and alls, uh, qua eat quaaludes. And they'd uh, be perfectly normal. So they had a very bad habit. And that night, I guess they need two and all. And there was uh, a guy that set him up at four in the morning to buy two and alls off this dealer in Brooklyn called Steve. And they offered forty dollars a two and all to come in because it was so late. So Steve came in. Now the rest is speculation on my part because I did it very much undercover. After the murder, I wasn't able to get a hold of Sid because Malcolm McLaren turned into the circus, and then he died before I ever got to talk to him. Now, what happened was Sid shot up the two and alls, passed out right away. Now, Nancy either didn't want to pay the guy the $40 or whatever, but she pulled a knife on him, I speculate. And the guy either fought with her and she fell on the knife and died, or he stabbed her. And he took all the money, because he used to keep rolls of hundreds, and split to California. And uh, Sid woke up in the morning and couldn't see Nancy, so he went out and got something to eat came back, found her in the bathroom, dead, and went in a state of shock, called the police. They came in and arrested him. And if you ever see, when they're taking him out, he's smiling, because it was sort of gallows laughter. He just totally fried. And uh, she was his whole life. He wouldn't have killed her, because she was everything to him. Mother, girlfriend, manager. So, uh, so anyways, he's in jail. He gets out. He's thrown back in for slicing up Patty Smith's brother. And, uh, Finally, in the case, they found on Nancy's knife, there was two different blood types, and one didn't match Sid's. So they let him go that night, and also her knife had the throng in it, and Sid was going to kill her. 
he do it with his own knife. Yeah, right. Out of pride. Oh, you take the thongs out. Oh, you take the thongs out because when you wear it in your back, you yeah. can see the throng, so yeah. it concealed it. So, so uh, sit in the knife. So it was obviously Nancy's. And so when the cops let him go, uh, all he had to do is show up the next morning and do a blood test. And he wouldn't have been the prime suspect. Now this tuna dealer found out about this, and there was a party for Sid that night, Michelle Robinson, he was living with her, Sid and his mother. And Sid, the mother, had been neglecting him all his life. She used to, she was a junkie, and she had all these uh, hippies stayed her days to beat up Sid and that, so he hated hippies. And, uh, well, he even got the name Vicious because he was a, he was a teddy bear, the guy. Yeah. He's a real nice guy. So, uh, anyways, uh, this friend of the tune dealers came down and gave Sid some smack. And Sid hadn't, like, banged up the whole time when he was in jail, so he was, uh, his resistance was really low. And the guy told it was weak, so he gave Sid a lot. Michelle noticed the guy was just doing a little bit when he banged up, and he's a heavy junkie. So she ran in to find Sid, and he was OD'd. So they packed him in the ice, threw that guy out, and he came too. And he went to bed. Now, she was, his mother was supposed to wake him up at quarter to ten to uh, go down for blood tests at eleven. And she fell asleep, never woke him up, and at exactly 10.35, he died. Now, his mother woke him up, he would have lived because he just sort of, I guess he ate it too and all and went to sleep and it just reacted everything. And once he was dead, case closed. They didn't care anymore. You think it was neglect on his mom's part? Or? Sure, all his life, that's what drove him to it. And, uh, and then they killed him. But Sid never killed Nancy, and there's a film coming out exploiting the fact that he did. So it's about time it's, the story was told right away. So there's still a story to be told after all these years. Yeah. So, uh, Sid was a practical joke now. We all know that. Yeah. He was a very personal guy, very friendly guy, very not punk kind of guy, until he got on stage. What was your favorite practical joke that he ever played? Well, we wanted to live in this apartment. What was going on in there with, with the insane, usual insanity that was going on? Yeah. <laughs> so you said that they lived on the second floor. I lived on the fourth floor, all the way upstairs to the back, that back apartment there. Next door to me was Barb. Of course, Cheetah talks about Barb in his book. Uh, and it was just... It was just always fun. It was always parties, man. It was, you know, either I would come home from classes about 1, 1 30. I used to have to go to go to work at 5. So it's, most of the time, Steve, uh, Steve was home. So either he'd stop in or I'd stop in. Um, classic example of Steve. I come home one day, start knocking on the door. I look down the hallway because there was a the kitchen. I went into a hallway. He's sleeping. He's, he's laying this woman in the kitchen. <laughs> I knock at him, I look, I start laughing, he just looks up, waves, says, one minute. <laughs> I go back in, I went upstairs. <laughs> um, and of course, there's the infamous story of him and Cheetah, you know, getting butt naked, answering the door to some Jehovah Witnesses and invited them in. <laughs> so it, it, this is the kind of stuff. They one day broke, I got into uh, uh, Barb's um, park. Richard. This girl from Lutheran City Bar in Pan Ridge came down and she goes, Oh, can you know, um, watch my rooms? Uh, I got a date tonight. And he here go up the steps, tell him I'll be out there like 20 minutes and doing my laundry. She said, Okay, she goes, she takes off. We went, Oh boy. And we went upstairs and completely rearranged all of her furniture. And, um, uh, he had like panties on a ceiling fan and shit. Um, it was like, yeah, it was amazing. She was watching some of his kids, um, and we would go, we set up a whole little teapot for he set with the bears, and then we put on metal machine music and left. <laughs> and so the guy comes, the guy comes, and um, yeah, knocks on the door. Yeah, yeah, she said he's going to go in. Bam, he's down upstairs, not fucking fast. And he's going to go, tell him I'm calling. He's like, <laughs> Did she ever hear from him again? No! <laughs> of course not. You guys ruin a relationship. How do you That's like the that? same chick we stole the car to go to New York. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's all.
hilarious. <laughs> so um, he was also, we had kind of touched on this political thing. He said he wasn't really so political when he was with the Dead Boys, but later got yeah. to be that way. Um, yeah, I was a political one. If you had gone in a political direction, how do you think it would have turned out? Do you think it would have been the same as it was, or do you think it would have become something entirely different? I think it would have been uh, somewhere in the middle because you know, we were the chops to bang it all up, and uh, the lyrics that Sim did write, like uh, Third Generation Nation, this one, and, uh, it was a good, you know, second album, we should have been more like that, I thought. You know, but it never happened. We got lost that wheel. And, so, um, Guns N' Roses, the spaghetti incident, ain't it fun? What was your reaction when you found out they were doing that? I thought it was cool. Even Axel? Axel was just a little weird. You know, standoffish, but yeah, even you know, Slash is up with you guys that all, you know, actually sought me out in Europe to make sure I was cool with them doing it. You know, and Andrew went down to St. Mark's place and walked up the town to his mom and we didn't get right on my eyes. And, uh, you know, I was very pleased with it. Uh, obviously, because it makes money on them, but also they did stay stage so close to the original. They did. They really did. You they know, did a really great job on Yeah, they really did. That was like that. Was cool. so most people, they do a cover, especially Dead Boys cover. They tend to scratch it up, they fast, do this and that, so you know, we didn't destroy it. Uh, there's not very few good versions of like Sonic and Mr. and Mr. Yeah. And that, that might have been the best album that we put out as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Because it was, it was tight from the beginning yeah. to end, and that was just like so, so cool. So when, when Rocket decided that they were going to reunite, did they approach you at all about that? And would you have done it if the opportunity had been presented? Well, yeah, I did. I went on tour. Oh, you did do? It was in 2004, right? Uh, something like that, yeah. No, you know, I think had this three-day um, kind of a master class called uh, Disaster World in LA. And he had a bunch of different great headliners and all that, but then he um, wanted to do the rock with And, you know, since the records, the album had come out of Swagville, and it was eight years back. Um, we did the white bass, and um, we all think about getting that here. You know, then we got the email, well, you knew this was coming, you know? <laughs> and what do you guys think about doing this gig, you know? And so we had by the whole festival the last night and uh, it went so well, you know, it was really kind of silly not to be more with it. Um, and to me, Rock was always kind of unfinished business, always kind of, uh, you know, I just feel like we had any closure, you know? It kind of fell apart more than it did, yeah. sort of. And so I thought that was cool to go into this. So we ended up getting our hands for five weeks being grumpy old men, you know. I mean, me and Dave were not getting along. It was like when we first got back together in the first rehearsal, it was an eight hour rehearsal. He probably fought for six years. Wow. You know? <laughs> I was mean, just old shit, you know, coming up. Back. Boiling so, up yeah. again. Yeah, and uh, so, because that was a resentment tour. And then later on, we did a couple others. They um, had a lot more, you know, cordial and uh, 
Me and Dave are actually really good friends right now. We were totally in the same place. And we, there was no, no tension anymore at all. Did you record new material with them, or was that? Well, this is a, this is a full bar fly out. Okay. Yeah, that was what we did with that. Put it on. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so, I know this is going to be tough, but 1990, and Steve dies in jail. You and him were tighter than tight. How did you find out about it? I know how you felt about it, but how did you find out about it? Well, it's in my book. It's the open chair from the book. But, um, I was out the night before. Uh, basically, Steve and me had planned to get together because uh, we were going to do another project together. Yeah. There was some guys from uh, England, you know, like, uh, be like uh, Tony James and, and the Ron from Dodson Medics. You know, we had everything going. Um, I got down to New York. I got up uh, to Connecticut to my act, and I came back. I felt friends with things and ready to go. And Somebody told me that they said Stiv, they did a rehearsal hall, and Stiv was rehearsing this project without me. So I was totally devastated, like I haven't got really drunk. Not now. And the next morning, I wake up to the buzzer, and space comes down. You know what space is? Yeah. He comes tearing up the stairs, it's 2 o'clock, it's what I gotta talk to you. He takes me over to downtown Beirut. Double for you, you know, push one of the numbers, drink that. And I was like, hey, they had a beer, they had a beer, they had a beer, they had a beer, they had a So they realized I was going to win, man. It was really weird. Something's up. Who's going to, who's dead? The only thing person I can think of would be who would be the one. She would like to have 70 days or something. And, uh, they were, I go, so who's dead? You know, still. And it was like, I so like, you know, you get really scared, you know, like a chill. I got to like, get a chill. Like, oh my God. And um, I just went nuts for a while. I went on all the time. And then after that, I kind of built in the deep end of the world. It was, it was still the last one that I was actually thinking about that. Yeah. And, um, and especially under the circumstances yeah. that he did because of what he did on stage. I mean, yeah. Like he said, he didn't go to the doctor because he did more to himself than he suffered from that car. Yeah. yeah. And it was, um, I just wanted to arm pilot with like, this uh, trans state that I was like, I could have been on another one. And that was the other thing, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was that show um, because you were gracious enough to come down and play. You reconstituted the Ghetto Dogs. You played with Dark Carnival, which was amazing. I want to thank you privately, personally, and publicly for that right well, now. Thank you for putting the show together. We raised thirteen hundred dollars for Stephen and Marion, who were absolutely wonderful, wonderful people. They were always behind Stiv. They were always yeah. behind you guys. They were at your shows. They were your cheerleaders. Yep. And that's saying something coming from the background that he came from, for them to be there like that. So, what was it like getting together with Ron and Scott? Obviously, oh, well, now that's. Yeah, no, it was great. So, you know, I flew into Detroit, you know. And, uh, I mean, this was the Stooges yeah. and the well, Destroy know, All Monsters well, and the Dead Boys guys, together. I've known those guys for a number of years, but um, they were playing with them. You yeah. know? And uh, so, we were just having rehearsing. It was funny because we were doing. Um, Oh, then voice songs, you know, and uh, no, it was a song. I got me you can't play it that fast. You got to slow it down. It's record, you know, loses it if you speed it up like that. You know, you me and Ronnie got to you know, argue about that. But then after you listen to those tapes, you're ready to write about that. You know? And uh, those guys are great people, good, good players. Uh, there's nothing like sitting down. You know, Ron is one of my idols. He's sitting there. Playing loose and TVI and all that shit with the little man, you know. Um, I thought, you know, as, as great as that night was, Jeff Dahl came in from yeah. Los Angeles. He paid his own way to come in and yeah. play with you and yeah. play with the Ghetto Dogs. And 
that was possibly actually maybe one of the last times Larry Lewis was on stage. Yeah. Yeah, which was amazing. And you know, another one of the people that we've lost and everything. He was a good band. Yeah, and, and Dave Liston on drums, yeah. and now he's down in Nashville at the Johnny Cash Museum, which is really good for him. Yeah. Okay, I look him up. He was kind of all famous up but yeah, definitely. So and and that was that was of all the great bands that night, the Dark Carnival set was by far oh, definitely great. one of the highlights of the night for sure. Fun hanging out with those guys. Uh, I appreciate them doing it. You know, it's also nice. Like you know, just like people, the guys from Detroit, the whole gang, they really um, supportive and care about it. Was, you know, I really, I played with. I want to suppose something different after that. And um, I got some told you I got the phone. And the first person there was Rob Tyner, the man's a father. You know, he's cheating on this story about everybody, you know, dying and Jeff Wild and you know, here's some of the philosophy, philosophical advice. And uh, we went to a tour of this old movie theater we played, we had this huge catwalk. Just to see the theater in Detroit. Oh, it's where Harry and Pete got pushed and stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, before he died, yeah. And, um... And you played there? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I got a score for a lot of time, you yeah. know. And he was one of the first people to, you know, Paul and stuff like that. All that sort of stuff. It was nice when people were honored, you know, if you were big fans of, you know, honor. You know, they actually, you know, people you know, up here. And it all comes around full circle in the end. So, to end, where's this going? Where are the Dead Boys going? Is this going to be? Is is this going to be a, a thing, or is this like a one-off tour for the album? Or are you going to record? Well, the second album's 40th anniversary next year. Okay. So there's probably a good chance we'll be recording that. Okay. Unless they can. The companies make their bonds with answers. One of the things that I talked to them about was so letting me go into the studio with the masters. It's going to duplicate it when you go in. They run us an amp farm and things like that. And so we kind of you know, beef it up some. Um, other than that, it would be, you know, and that would be a box set. You want, like, you know, the original and then be cheap for a remix, you know? Um, then throw on younger Lager Snout of Year Two and have well, yeah, well, that was, you know, that, that, that was just a cassette tape that stood in hand as a bag. You know, these guys, yeah. It was nothing special, I think. Oh, I thought you put that out. I heard that, I heard that you were the one that remixed. Was it? Oh, no, the second one that you did, I got the stuff, it was already remixed, it was already done, all you done is be cute and better. Uh -huh. But it wasn't like the fact that, you know, really changed the sound of the record. Um, yeah, this guy killed me. I don't know what he is. I'm not sure. I can't recognize him. But anyway, um, we never saw dying for it as usual. <laughs> So we can look forward to seeing the Dead Boys around for a while. Well, so listen, you know, Jake is a very good singer. Is all right. You were you were right about him. Definitely, he definitely carries the torch. Yeah. And what he said tonight, the the tribute that he yeah. paid, the shout out that he gave, I yeah. just got this cold chill when he said that. That was just so so cool. He's a huge Dead fan. He does not want to replace him. You know, um, he was a that's rare too because yeah, usually when a band does that, you know, they say, I'm the front man now. Yeah, I think when we, as we do like the second album, we're going to do that. And uh, next year, I think we'll try to re Jake our great songs. Yeah, I think we're going to continue as a band, uh, boys. I think we're going to be the right? I sure hope so. Yeah, no reason not to. Cheetah Chrome, great guitarist. Dead Boys, great band, history, punk rock, United States. You guys were actually named one of the top ten best albums, Young Loud and Snotty, by the Rolling Stone Readers Poll. And Rolling Stone considered you guys one of the top American punk bands as well. And that's pretty high praise, and that's good enough for me. And I thank you.
<laughs> yeah, it's always better at afterward, right? right? 2020 hindsight is always yeah, best. Sure. So I appreciate it. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. And you're going to rock. Yeah. Hi, this is Jeff Redding, and uh, we're here in uh, Hermitage, Pennsylvania, just on the other side of Youngstown, Ohio. And we're talking with Frank Sesich. Hello. <laughs> who, uh, as you're going to find out, has a very rich history. So, Frank, to start out, let's jump into the Wayback Machine and uh, go back to 1969 and talk about Blue Ash and the formation of the band. Um, one of the first power pop bands? Yeah, it, 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 yeah, probably in the world. Us and the Bad Finger, uh, we were even together before the Raspberries, about a year before them. So, um, Jim Kenzer and I from Sharon here uh, started the band. We were, had been in band since we were in junior high. and. Uh, we started Blue Ash the summer of 1969. We were together for 10 years. Had two albums out, uh, one on Mercury Records and one on Playboy, and we were signed by the same guy who signed the New York Dolls to Mercury, Paul Nelson. Well, that's pretty cool. And you had a, a few minor hits, and, yeah. and I know that, that um, the, the Blue Ash records are really popular in Europe. And, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, as yeah, you've been over yeah. in Spain, it's like really huge. Yeah, we toured there. Spain all over last summer, and it was great because we have two Spanish labels over there that put out our things and we were on national radio, uh, Radio 3, El Satano show at, at drive time and played live with acoustic guitar sponsored by Gibson of, oh, that's pretty uh, cool. of, of Spain so we did a live show at drive time broadcast all over the entire country so it was pretty cool. Was was Blue Ash always intended to be a power pop band or yeah, well, were you trying to go for like that garage psychedelic kind of <laughs> sound that was going on when, at we, that time. when we started there was a lot of like boogie jam bands like uh, that were going on and, uh, and we didn't like that heavy metal started coming out and that and it just wasn't our thing we didn't like the singer songwriters either we always liked the songs from the, the 60s the who the hobbies the beatles stones. so when we started writing our own originals when they have an original band in 69 we wrote in that kind of vein and that's how it kind of happened except we had martial lamps <laughs> so it was kind of a little uh, a little yeah, bit of the heavy metal yeah, side there yeah, yeah. <laughs> but with pop songs so i guess that's how the power pop started with all those bands right yeah. um so um tell us about the freak out club where you debuted in 69. the freak out was a great place it was over in um uh, I'm, i'll take you there this afternoon but we, it's it started out over between Gerard and Niles at McKinley Heights, then it burned down and then they moved it to Youngstown. That was in 68, it started in 69, it was there. But it was a wildly painted psychedelic place and uh, it was great because they'd have, I mean, you could go on a Wednesday night and James Gang were like the regular band there. Or, uh, you know, Glass Harp or uh, the Pied Pipers, Human Beings, all those bands played their left end, um, Blue Ash, we, we, us and left end, that was our home, that's where we, uh, rehearsed and everything. So it's a great club to play. So, as you said, you put out two albums, um, although I understand that there are rumors that there are many, many live bootlegs out there of, of you guys. There's all period. kind of blue ash things out everywhere. There's the, the uh, one of the more famous ones, bootlegs, was done by my friend uh, uh, Mike McKay. He did it on a cassette recorder when we played with Raspberries at, at Packard Music Hall. It was like 3,000 kids were there. That was a great one. But there's tapes all over the place. Blue Ash, when we put out uh, the Around Again album in 2004, Not Lame, there was uh, 219 tapes I had found at Peppermint Productions that we had done. <laughs> and those were studio tapes, not live. I mean, just studio tapes. So that's what compromises most of the things that are out in Spain now on the Hearts and Arrows album. And, all and you had to go through all of that material to come up with 44 songs to come out with yeah. Around Again. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that yeah. must have been a project and a half. Yeah, and... oh yeah, just, I still have, I have tons of things downstairs that I have never even listened to. I just... I bet the memories came flooding oh, back yeah, immediately yeah. as soon as you heard them. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you never even remember writing a song like that. Yeah. Why why did the band end up breaking up and after the, the album in 77? Well, after the album in 77, and we got a really good shot of making it then. We sold over 54,000 copies of that, and Playboy went out of business. So, I mean, it, by that, that had just taken all the wind out of ourselves. And right around that time, uh, Stu was coming around a lot. He was coming back here a lot and wanted to start doing the power pop thing. He's like, hey, came over, let's record it. It's cold. It's That'd be great. Yeah. So we went up to Kirk Yano's studio and Jimmy Zero Blitz and I and Stip recorded the first demos of that. 
I don't know if anybody knows it. Them was real cool. I was trying to find those. And then Snip took them to uh, uh, L.A. and played them for Greg Shaw, and he signed us up immediately. Went up and it. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, did you do much after that before joining the Dead Boys, or was it... Because uh, I know that this would have been in like '78 we started doing that, and then right in early January or so of '79, Stiv called me, wanted me to come out to LA, so I went out there, and there was going to be a big tour with this um, Dutch guy that was putting all these punk bands together. Cheetah and Gita came out, a lot of people came out, and and that sort of didn't happen. And then we uh, went with Bomb Records, and then Stiv, they, Cheetah and Stiv started booking some Dead Boys things, and they called me up and. You know, come up and rehearse. I guess Magnum didn't want to do it, so I played with the original band, and then I played off and on for the uh, next year and a half with them. I played about 100 gigs with them, you know, with the Dead Boys. And then, you know, Cheetah broke his his, his wrist at, at Keith Richards' uh, birthday party. The so skating we, party, yeah. Skating uh... party. So, so then, then we uh, we had a whole tour, so we got asked George Cavanis to go with us from uh, Hamburg Damage. So is is that what led to the original breakup? Then was it was after the accident? Or, um, or they was had it already, already, they already, already been or? they had already been broken up, and then they got back together. And then I guess Jeff didn't want to do it, so Stiv had called me, and then then we just started mixing the the Stiv Bader stuff with the Dead Boy stuff, and, and just did gigs till about 1981 when the Disconnected album came out, and Brian James came over. We did a tour with him. He joined the band, so it was like a, a weird. Thing. You know, mm. For about a month, we toured all over New England, the Midwest, and everything. The, the, um, the winter, to December, when John Lennon was shot. I think that's where the day the Disconnected album came out, actually, that Monday. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> How weird heavy. is that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's know. when it was released that day. Wow. So, but I remember um, Jeff Jones was our road manager. We, we had to play in New York about a week later, so he took us up to the Dakota building. And I remember me and Steve and Brian were there, and, and Jimmy, and... There's just millions of flowers all over the place. It was a weird time, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah I can yeah, imagine yeah. it would be. Because I, rem I remember that period and, and everything. And, yeah. I mean, everybody was stunned for yeah. so long after that happened. Because, I mean, how could somebody shoot Well, I remember that, that that night, uh, and, and Blitz called me when it happened. I think we talked all night. And he was up in Toronto or something. But I think we talked for like six or seven hours just through the night, just talking. It was like one of those mind-blowing uh lifetime things that happens you know yeah that was crazy so um so front page news came out in 77 and i noticed in the liner notes that um one of your world influences was stiff yeah and so how and when did you actually meet him originally i met him in 1967 and i was i was like 15 or 16 and he was he's a couple years older than me you know he was two years older than me but I had met him at um, a house where a lot, a lot of long-haired guys used to hang out at hippie types uh, over in uh, at the college you know at Youngstown and we, we would go to, to um, uh, teen dances and stuff like that they had carousel teen clubs I'll show you one of those places today We would just hang out, and there's a whole group of us that hung out. Mike Miller, who was uh, 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 the Mother Goose uh, manager, um, uh, Karen Wagner Carruthers, who passed away. Like she was Steve's girlfriend in high school. Great girl. You met Johnny up at in Cleveland. That's her. That's her son. Okay. <laughs> Johnny Carruthers. But there was a whole bunch of us to hang out. My girlfriend Joanne Rose at the time, Marty Magner from Mother Goose, and that's kind of how the Mother Goose connection came too. Since I quit Mother Goose, Goose to uh, join. Um, Blue Ash, Stiv was kind of my replacement. I was like the, the bass player, kind of lead singer of the band. And then when they, they reformed and got him in the band, they were more theatrical thing. Then. Okay, so um, Stiv said in 86 when we interviewed him, mm -hmm. and he was talking about um, a blues band that he played in. And I asked Cheetah about it yesterday, and he said that that was a Stiv story. So he actually was? 
Or was it more of a garage no, type band? No, Mother Goose was more of a theatrical Alice Cooper type band. They did things, but still it was always, like they would bring Karen out, his girlfriend is the sacrificial virgin, and they would like, have her on a tray or something. I don't know. I have a film I'll have to show. I, I told Danny about it. I'll have to get it to him, and if I can get permission from the guy who took it, it's the famous old Mother Goose film. It, it's terrific. Stiv used to bring it around and show it everywhere. It's like eight minutes long, but it's silent, and it'll give you a good clue of it. But uh, yeah, but they kind of did things like that. The first, I brought Stiv on stage. I must in this before Blue Ash was actually together. It was me, Steve Acker. I don't know if you know Acker. He played in a band called Law, that was on MCA Records, and um, Goog Yendrick from. Uh, Blue Ash, and Myron Grumbacher, who played with Pat Benatar. Mm -hmm. I got a pickup band for this little festival that was out in Newton Falls, and it got Stiv as the lead singer, and I brought him on stage for the first time. It was early 69 or so, and he did his thing. But the funny thing was, he, we did like Stray Cat Blues and some Stooges songs and things like that. We brought a can of whipped cream out, and he was shaking it in his crotch here. <laughs> And she would sit all over. I go, this guy's nuts. <laughs> I, and, there's, and people were going crazy, but they took a mic stand and threw it in the air, and it came down, clipped him in the head, and took a big gash out of his head. So the whipped cream he, is all mixing with the blood, and it's like this pinkish orange kind of thing all over. He looks like this monster from hell. And the people just went crazy. I ended up taking him to the emergency room to get stitched up. Was ended. that the night that he stuck his head in the in the bass drum? He might have done that there too. I can't remember. Because because yeah. I heard I heard yeah. something about that yeah. that he was all bloody yeah. because of an accident with a microphone yeah, or something, yeah, yeah, and yeah, he stuck his said. head like right in the yeah, kick drum. Uh, this guy's when that happened with Peggy, I started to become. Uh, I just wanted to be a singer. First time I got up and sung was uh, was Mick Jagger's birthday, in fact. And uh, it was in Cansville, Ohio. And I uh, uh, called this guy, let me in the concert free, saying, Oh, yeah, I can imitate Iggy on stage. And then I hid from the rest of the day because I never sung before. And they got me, and I got real drunk. And I was with Frank from Blue Ash. That was the band. And uh, we did I Want to Be Your Dog. And I dove off stage and with the mic stand. And it caught in, in the uh, ground, split my head open. And all this blood started coming out. So I put my head inside the bass drum to make a swastika with the blood. And uh, the drummer, Blue Ash, threw up. So Myron Grunbacher, you know, Pat Benetton, yeah. out, he jumped on the drums. And I just went total mayhem. Like Frank dove in the audience, snapped the neck off his bass. And I climbed the uh, tarp and was throwing blood on people. And and that was, but he used to come to a lot of the Blue Ash gigs. Then Jeff Jones always got, like, Mother Goose to open up for us, different versions of it. So they must have played you know, on a bill with us 25 times or so. Was that, that was kind of um, um, the precursor? Be then he went to uh, Cleveland and, and started Frankenstein. That was the, you know Blitz and, and Cheetah and all. That. How did how did Left End kind of fit into that? Was well, that part of that whole scene? Yeah, Left End, but they were just part of the whole scene. Dennis Sasansky was the uh, uh, lead singer of the Pied Pipers. Dennis and, the Menace. Yeah, Dennis, <laughs> then it became Dennis the Menace. Then uh, Left End all, all you know came from di different soul bands and stuff like that, and it all kind of mixed together. It's all kind of incestuous. Because <laughs> they kind of seem to be almost pre-punk in a way, too, oh, yeah, yeah. A, a, with a lot of their attitude. I mean, they were more of a rock band, yeah. not what we would consider to be punk today, yeah, yeah. but yet they kind of had that sort of yeah. bad boy attitude Yeah, it was that, that Youngstown thing. Going. <laughs> yeah. So so what was it like touring with the Stooges at that time? Uh, it, it, it was crazy. We did quite a few jobs with them. We played, one was in, in uh, the Oregon Ballroom in Chicago would have been 73, right around my birthday in June. And that was really crazy. We played with the, the band Detroit and uh, uh, and the Stooges, and that was a weird place because it has the weirdest acoustics in the world. But the most famous one we did was um, February 9th, 1974, the, the Metallic A.O. concert. We, uh, we were the opening band right before the Stooges. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so that was pretty crazy. And that that was, and we, we knew it was coming because you could tell it was coming all night. The audience was crazy. And there was like 4,000 people. There was Michigan Palace. It was back. Blue Ash never sounded better in our lives. My favorite great gig we ever played. We, and we always sold a lot of records in, Al in Detroit. So it was cool. We got a lot of airplay. But when AE came on, we just stood at the side of the stage because we knew how crazy it was. And they had, to, they had to literally carry him out, you know. And he, you know, you've heard all the things that happened. But the funniest part was we left one of our guitars, Jim Kenzer's uh, Epiphone uh, Sheraton, on stage. And 
after the, after the gig, it was the crazy, and then Snooze's never played again for 29 years. That was the last gig, you know. <laughs> and there was, they started throwing eggs and ice and beer cans and everything, but there were egg splatters all over Jim's guitar, you know. Like yellow splattered egg, and it just dried it. Jim never took it off. He still has that guitar. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's 43 years ago, right? And the egg splatters are still on there. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a classic night. <laughs> they just stuck on the thing. That's <laughs> he would even play it with those egg splatters on. So that's pretty, that's my funny story from that night. So so, talking about record sales, yeah. Blue Ash never really sold a lot of records. No, no, I know no. It, it might be kind of a sensitive subject. No. Yeah. Well, the first album we had to sell twenty five thousand to make a second album. We sold nineteen thousand five hundred. The guys in the A and R department loved us. The promo guys hated us. There was this big war, and we got one more single, and if that didn't make it, we would be dropped. You know how they drop you from the labels. And even Dick Clark tried to make it a hit, but played it on American Bandstand and everything, but we we couldn't do it, so we were dropped from the label. Then a lot of other labels were really interested in us, Columbia, RCA, and we flew up and did uh, things for them, and something at the last minute would always fall through. And Nemperer Records, who Nat Weiss on, with the Romantics run and a bunch of different people, jazz guys, but he was uh, uh, the Beatles' American lawyer, Brian Epstein's friend. Okay. That's where uh, John uh, Lennon, and, well, Paul McCartney met, hung out with his wife when they did the, uh, the Johnny Carson show in New York. They stayed at Nat's apartment. So he was a cool guy. Spent a whole weekend with us. He was going to sign us, and then it fell through. So we eventually got to the Playboy, which was on CBS, which was a lot of our CBS connections helped promote that, too. So that album, the Playboy album, actually sold about 55,000 copies. It seems kind of strange to me because when when I listen to like the the, mm -hmm. the first album or whatever, yeah. you know, it's very contemporaneous to what was going on yeah, at that yeah, time yeah. and bands that had hits mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, sure. And it doesn't, like Slade or bands like that, yeah, it fit right in. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't make sense that that well, Blue Ash wouldn't have. Well, we had we had regional hits. We were, we were big in Miami. We were big in Detroit. We we're big in Boston. But we couldn't break like LA and and, and 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 Los Angeles. And back then records would sell we you could have a hit in Texas in the South like we did with Look at You Now, all over the South and not have a national hit. And we were number one in dozens of different markets then. But it wouldn't break nationally. It's different now. It either goes all nationally or not. But back then they had a thing called regional hits. Mm -hmm. Like it's cold outside. That was when we were kids, me and Stiff that was a number one record here. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that that wasn't a hit all over the country. We had no idea because it was a hit here. Right. You know, it was a hit in Youngstown, Akron, and Cleveland. That was our world. Yeah, it was that Midwest sound. Yeah, it was you know, Midwest Cleveland, sound. Cleveland, Detroit, yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah, yeah. Chicago, it was, Buffalo. Yep, yeah, exactly. Whole... Exactly. And it was it would break in regions. So, um, over the years, there've been kind of number of different reunions mm -hmm. that that Blue Ash has done, and yeah. now you got it reconstituted, you just did some recordings, yeah. some material, um, how is that coming along, when is that going to be released? Well, we, we've started on a new Blue Ash album, the first one, it'll be in, in, in 40 years, and um, it, it's sounding great, we're doing it over at Amprion, and the, the Debbie Poets crew that toured with uh, Blue Ash, uh, uh, Pete Revere, who owns Amprion, uh, John Lemmick, and John Corey of the Deadbeat Poets, and it's me and Jim Kenzer, who are the nucleus of, of the Blue Ash. A lot of we're doing some old songs we've never recorded before. We got some brand new ones like Cousin Dickie's shirt and my she's my car. Actually, it's coming on great. So what what it looks like is going to happen is I've been talking to some labels in Europe and we're going to do a two-sided album. Um, uh, one's going to be Deadbeat Poets, six songs on it, vinyl, and the other half Blue Ash. So if we go on tour, we'll take both bands. Again. Both bands. Kind of like Par Parliament Funkadelic. Right, right, right. They used to come out as the Parliament in the suits and do the 60s. I want to testify, then they'd switch over and do the psychedelic stuff. Yeah, cool guys. They actually came to see Blue Ash play. That's how we got to tour Canada from their road manager. They stopped in in Youngstown one time, and um, they were playing Stamp Auditorium or something. We were playing an after prom at the uh, Voyager Inn, and they heard all this music and came up. Of course, the kids were thrilled with the Parliament Funk and Dalek showed up at their prom, you know. Oh, yeah. I and imagine. they were jamming. We, we hung out, and then their their, uh, uh, their road manager really liked us. He was a bookie agent to him, booked us all over Canada. So it was kind of cool. So um, another 
probably source uh, topic. Um, Bill Bartolin, your yeah, yeah, songwriting partner and guitarist. Yeah, he passed away in in, in October of two thousand nine. He had cancer, and uh, they they really uh, on Labor Day discovered it, and he died a month later. You know, and it was a terrible loss. Uh, still real close with his son and and his his uh, his ex his uh, widow uh, Darla. But, uh, yeah, it's just terrible. So I'd known him since I was a little kid, you know. So. Yeah, as I noticed that, um, it, that it, at least on um, front page news, yeah. that the two of you yeah. wrote all the songs oh, together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, we so you were pretty much the team songwriting for the whole... team. Yeah, we did that. Jim would write on his own and everything, but uh, and he, Jim and I were writing a couple new ones together on the new album. But yeah, on front page news, no more no less, we wrote all the songs for Bill Bartle. So we mentioned around again. Yeah. Um, what's the story with the alternate around again? Oh, that, this is uh, fun. These guys were called uh, the Power Pop Criminals, and they were out of like a little country in between Spain and uh, uh, France called Andorra. It's mm -hmm. up in the Pyrenees Mountains, and they would put out all these bootlegs all the time. And then, uh, uh, but I, which I thought was great, they would put out blue ash bootlegs when stuff was around, and. And a lot of people were mad at him for putting out bootlegs. And I said, you know, I, I don't care if you guys put out stuff. I said, you know, Mercury Records has had this, been sitting on that for 40 years, and they've never put it out. So you're doing more to, to help me than they are. <laughs> so they thought it was kind of cool. So they, then they, when that came up, they even bootlegged that, the, the uh, around, alternate around again and put like 10 different songs on it from different bootlegs from Blue Ash. So they were kind of cool. They're still around. They they keep changing their names. Power Pop Lovers, Power Pop Criminals, and and they're probably not even from Andorra. They're probably from Russia. You know, so I have no idea. <laughs> things keep coming out all over the place. So. That's uh, that's cool. So all right, so let's just focus and, and let's talk about Stiv a little sure. bit. Sure. So, um, so you knew Stiv for a real long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I met him when I was about fifteen. So. What can you tell us about his younger days, his family, Stephen Marion, yeah. his parents were always very supportive of him and the bands that he was in and things. And, and Yeah, I was, like my dad worked at the steel mill, so did Stiv's dad over in Youngstown. Even Stiv worked there for a while, went into the mills, but he hated it. Came home and told his dad one thing, because I just, you know, I can't do this. <laughs> go there and Though the names have changed over the years, the steel mills still remain. And his dad was always real supportive. His dad sung too. He was a singer, and, and uh, they were always very supportive. Two of the nicest people you ever want to meet. Yes. You know, well, I had so many fun times over at that hospital. Always hospitable and, and just great people. Born and raised just outside of Youngstown, Ohio, this is the house that Stu grew up in. A very normal, uh, he was an only child, you know, so very normal uh, Catholic upbringing. Went to St. Rose School, St. Rose Church, and then Ursuline High School, which is the big uh, Catholic school mm -hmm. of all of Youngstown there, and probably all. Uh, uh, upbringing. He, he, 
contemporaneous. I mean, he went with a lot of crazy people that went to that school. Ed O'Neill from uh, Married with Children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> he was he was a couple grades ahead of Steve, you know, at the, in the same classes and everything. So um, very very normal like that. Uh, as he was always crazy like that, even as a teenager, you know. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the, the the whole Catholic upbringing and everything. And uh -huh. Steve always said that his being an altar boy yeah. oh, led yeah. him down the path yeah. that oh, he yeah. ultimately yeah. took. Yeah. But it must have been a strange dynamic having that Catholic upbringing and then doing the kind of music that he was doing. What did his? How did his parents feel about that? Like at the beginning, I think they were they were always pretty supportive of it. You know, they always were. They were always at the gigs, even even the real early gigs, Mother Goose gigs and stuff like. That. They were always there. And as you know, the old Dead Boys gigs, they show up everywhere mm -hmm. in Cleveland, Pittsburgh. They were there all the time. He was real proud of them too. You know, mm -hmm. he was proud of his you know working class roots, and he was he, he was a good guy. They, they were very down to earth people. And he, he just had that, 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 that clay craziness and gleam in his eye, and his dad had that same same gleam, you know? Right. Yeah. And and yet, and well, probably as a result, his dad <laughs> couldn't deal with the steel mills. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which sure. which makes sense. So, yeah. um, well, okay, so in 1969, and so Steve was around 20, I guess? Yeah, yeah, at he that point. 20. Did, did age make much of a difference to him? Did he care about it at all? I, I don't think he really did. Because he always looked ten years younger than he was, mm -hmm. except in the real later, you know, uh, Lord's days. But even when I was playing with him in '79, '80, '80, he always looked—he looked like he was 22. He didn't look like, you know. So I don't think it bothered him that much. When you first met him, what were your first what, first impressions of him? Other than the fact that he was crazy. <laughs> first time I met him, like I said, it was this old house by well, they said hippie and long hair people were hanging out and somebody had introduced me to him. Did he have long hair at that time? Yeah, he had long hair. And this girl walks down down the steps and I can't even remember her name was Kathy or something like that. And buckskin jacket, pretty you know, hippie girl and everything. And I just met you know, fifteen seconds before this, right? He goes, Hey Kathy, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, this is Frank. He goes, he's never been laid before. <laughs> I don't know what is going on here. She goes, really? And I said, and I'm like flabbergasted because I just met this guy, you know? She goes, oh, okay. She goes, he's kind of cute. She's, I said, wait, wait a minute. I said, what's going on? So I didn't do it, but that's just the kind of guy he was. He would just set you up like that. Yeah. He's piss take, you know, all the time, you know? Then we became great friends after. But that's, that's my, oh, after, you know, shaking his hand, that's the next thing that happened to me. <laughs> he doesn't even know me, right? Right. He's trying to set me up, there. and it works, you know. How oh, funny, yeah. I'd say he was. Uh, I've never he was told a that master, story. He was a master of timing. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely was a master yeah. of timing. What? Um, so, so, what was the general scene like at that time, or in the early seventies, uh, here in Youngstown area? There were a lot of clubs. Uh -huh. Like in the through this late 60s and early 70s, there were this carousel teen clubs, which were everywhere. The Freak Out had a teen dance on Sunday afternoons. So you could go there, no loose, you can go in there at any age. Everything was 18 and over, so there were a lot of clubs. It was 3 2 beer at 18. Right. But, I remember um, those days. <laughs> I mean, the Freak Out would be open from Wednesday through Sunday, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were clubs everywhere you could play every night of the week. There was a, a, a great band scene. So many great musicians came out. Just Youngstown were. Uh, Phil Keggy, Gary Markaski, who played with uh, uh, Coconut and uh, uh, Michael Stanley, Myron Grumbacher, we were all friends. Uh, played with Pat Benatar and, mm -hmm. and Roger Lewis and other people later on. The Holes in Road were a great band. There were just there was a dozen great bands and probably two dozen great places to play around. So it was a really, really thriving, thriving scene. You can make a good living at it and, and just play everywhere. Yeah, we already mentioned Left End. Human Beings was yeah, another you know, the, one. They well, were I, real big. I were at the Freak Out. I had this picture, and I've got to find it because there were like um, um, eight or nine guys in this picture, and we're all in there. And the picture was taken, shows everybody, and every single person in that picture later got signed to a different major label. And you know what? The, the chances of that are, I mean, there are guys from Glass Harp who got signed for DECA, 
uh, Stiv and, and and Dennis from the you know left end, all these people, Mark Yasky, Meyer, we're all in this picture. Steve Acker, your chances of getting signed to a major label are about as, as as good as your chances of getting signed to a major league baseball team. That's how rare that is. And there's nine of us in this picture that all went to different major labels out of Youngstown. How That's, crazy is that? That know? is pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the human beings then yeah, I they mean were they were one of them was in the picture too, I think. They were they were one of the precursors to power pop oh, yeah. as we know yeah. it today and and they kind of kind of sort of bridged the gap between power pop and the psychedelic garage stuff that uh, was going big on. Big influence on me was Ting Markle from there and I, I still got a picture in my mind of him leaning that Rick and Bacher against a dual showman, hitting a D chord on the Different. You're getting that feedback. That's what that is. That's how you get that. But I, you know, we'd see them everywhere at all the record hops here, and everything. and he was a great idol of mine and Stips. We all loved Tig. Everybody loved Tig. And he was the rhythm guitar player in the band. But yeah, they had a worldwide hit. You know. Yeah. And he would come back, and they, he would regale us with stories about them in Japan. They were like the Beatles. He'd see all these little Oriental faces pressed against them, <laughs> and he's screaming. <laughs> they were one of, one of my favorite bands yeah, from, yeah. from this area, from that period. Yeah. For sure. So, the the last version of the Dead Boys then, um, that played. Um, before Cheetah, or after Cheetah left the band, when you joined the band and George joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was around, what, 79, 80, right? Yeah, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah. So, um, I was out in L.A. Yeah. in January of 1980 and saw the shows Looked, at the Whiskey. Oh, yeah, okay. you were there when Belushi played. Yeah, and, okay. and, and the Rubber City Rebels, yeah. which, um, as I was saying on the way down here, I was, I was telling Chris um, that I had to travel almost 3,000 miles across the country yeah, to, see. to see a show that I could have seen in my backyard yeah, three bang. years earlier. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that's right. So how did how did it come about that John Belushi ended up on drums in that? Well, it, they knew him from before, and he had played the Blitz Benefit and everything, and, and they had hung out with him in New York. But he was out in L.A. and came up, and, and he was backstage. So. Um, we did a, a set, and we would always do a, an encore of Sonic Readers where people are cheering for an encore. So he's backstage, and Stiff comes out, and he says, there's this guy been bugging us backstage, wants to come out and play drums, you know, so we're going to let him go. So we bring him out, and of course, you may, he comes on the the, uh, the drum riser and takes a bow. Everybody went crazy, because he, he was the biggest star in the world at that time, the Animal House and mm -hmm. Blues Brothers. So he played, and people were going nuts. and. And at the end, there's just screaming and stuff like that. And so uh, he jumps off the drum riser and walks right up to me on the stage. He goes, I fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, no, you sounded great. <laughs> Actually, you know, the funny thing yeah. is, is that I don't even remember yeah. that. Yeah. I was just so enthralled with the fact that I was in L.A., yeah. I was at the Whiskey yeah, yeah. A Go Go, and I was watching the Dead Boys and the Rubber City Rebels playing. And it didn't <laughs> even dawn on me. That that was John Belushi yeah, on yeah. drums, and yeah. I found out years later yeah. that that was the case, and I've always wanted to know yeah, he, how that came yeah, about. He just came down and did the encore with us, and then we went up and partied up up in the uh, uh, um, uh, upstairs dressing room there, and he went next door and played with Muddy Waters. Oh wow! Waters. <laughs> so what a night, huh? Yeah, that yeah. is pretty crazy. So so did that series of shows? Did that? Lead toward the breakup of the band. Ultimately? No, no, we just kept touring. We toured all the way through, and all that spring, and went all the way through the Midwest, out west again. Went back to the whiskey and did three nights and sold them all out, two shows a night in May, with David Quentin on, because Blitz had left by then. And then we played all summer, did the uh, Disconnected album in August and September. We were supposed to go to Australia then. And Stiv kind of blew that off and, and went over and joined the, the Wanderers and did that thing and and uh, John Waters' this movie, yeah. Right, right. So Disconnected Band, the Dead Boys were still together when the Disconnected Band. Yeah, I was the kind of doing everything at one time, you know. And then we played the Starwood out there in L.A. when we did the Disconnected album. Then when Disconnected was released in December, we still went over to England in, in the fall. Came back in December, and that's when we did the last tour. Brought Brian James with him, so that was fun. I like Brian a lot, a good guy. Yeah, yeah that that Wanderers album, and and um, we we talked about that a little bit last night. And Cheetah thought that was really a brilliant album. Yeah, it yeah, really I like was an awesome record. And um, I um, 
saw that show. Mm -hmm. They played on the stake downstairs of the Agora. Yeah. And well, Blue Ash opened it. Oh, really? See, now I don't remember. I got, again, yeah, I was so enthralled with the I Wanderers. Just, I, I had and, Jim and I got George Cabinets, Eddie Best, and, and, and Mikey Hammer. It was kind of a Blue Ash, but we did this Blue Ash. And we got together and did a few gigs, and we opened up. And I remember it was an odd thing because Todd Rundgren, Todd was, Rundgren was sitting was right there. in front of me. You know, when I was playing, I go, this is pretty good. We had just done an interview with Todd. Mm -hmm. um, Utopia had just played the Coliseum like a few weeks before that. Mm -hmm. And... I was down there and I'm watching the Wanderers and I turn around and there's Todd Rundgren standing yeah. right in front of me and nobody recognized him. Yeah. I was the only person in the entire room that went up and talked to him and yeah. recognized him. I said, what are you doing here? Yeah. And he says, Oh, I'm, we're playing down in Akron and I just wanted to come up and see Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing and I'm looking right in front of me, right in front of me. I think, Todd Rundgren? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's like standing right. Oh, wow, that's that's pretty weird. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. That was that night. So, so did the disconnected project? Was that always supposed to be something separate, or was that that was always separate? Yeah. That was never to be wrapped into the Dead Boys. No, no, and... no, no. That was just for a great shot to do an album. Okay. Um, to recoup some of the money we had all spent of his. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as we know, in 1979, Power Pop was mm -hmm. like really an, an in thing. I call wave. that the, 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 the summer of Power Pop. Yeah, so, the, 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 the whole new wave thing. Summer. You know, yeah. punk was on its way kind of in a sort of a stagnant mode mm -hmm. at that point because the, now we had the Sex Pistols and all of the, the angry punk mm -hmm. bands coming yeah. out of England and people were kind of saying, well, we don't want that stuff mm -hmm. in America. And so then you had the Blondies and the other mm -hmm. new wave bands that were coming out. They were kind of power pop. Um, and um, how, how did that influence the direction of what the Dead Boys were doing and with what, um, with, with what the Disconnected band well, was doing? Well, I think with Jimmy, Zero. He was always the, the power pop guy. I always called him the Brian Jones of, of the Dead Voice. But he was always the, the fashion guy, the power pop guy. And I think he had a lot of, a lot of influence on that, too. And Stiv also was very, very loved the power pop sound. And he always loved my band, Blue Ass. So I think when I got in with them, we just started writing in, in, in that kind of a vein, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I always think, I, I won't look back, but the Dead Voice is one of the great power pop songs of all time. I even do it in my uh, uh, solo show sometimes, you know, pull it up. But yeah, Jimmy was a great songwriter in that, in that band. He always liked that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a natural fit that, that we went that way. And we got the striped coats and the, the teddy boy thing. So it kind of more uh, mod thing then, you know? And Stiv was also really influenced by garage oh, yeah, big music time. as yeah, well. And I, I'm sure yeah. that that was one of his... his more favorite types oh, yeah, of music. Yeah, yeah. He was a Nuggets guy, you know. He yeah, I mean, you know, he did tell even me. way back when, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Cold Outside, yeah. you know, all of that stuff yeah. that was that they were doing at that time. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, Too Much to Dream, yeah. Do you, yeah, that's another another great one. Um, do you know much about the last tour with Brian James and how it came about that he ended up leaving? Uh, well, it, what happened? Stibble just wanted to we had to do a, a tour for the Disconnected, you know, and I thought, yes, we definitely got to do this for um, um, uh, Greg Shaw. So he said, well, I'll, I'll bring Brian over, too. I said, that'd be great, you know. So we did that and just did the tour. And then what he actually wanted to do then was have two bands. He wanted to have us and the Wanderers, and neither us or the Wanderers wanted that, you know. So I said, I can't be in two bands. It's not gonna, that's not going to work, Stiv. It's, you can't, you know, mm -hmm. in two different continents. It's just not going to work. So then the Wanderers thing kind of petered up. And he would write me a lot. They were going to form this new band. And he kind of wanted me to come over to England, maybe play a second guitar on Lords of the New Church. when they, It wasn't called that then, but they were going to form this band. He had gotten in with Miles Copeland. But I didn't want to move. My, my wife was an only child, so I didn't want to move her over to England. So... And I had already started with Jimmy and and um, uh, Club, Club Wild. Wild. Yeah, and I thought Club Wild was a fantastic band. Yeah. Billy Sullivan and Jeff West from the Waldos and Blow Me Heads and everything he was in before. But I wanted to keep that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and other than, because it had been so helter-skelterish, you know, the trips to the desert and the Winnebago things. And I didn't want to 
live like that and take my wife over to live like that. But it turned out really good for him. It was good for him over there. That was good for me here with Club Wow. But I actually thought Club Wow was going to be very big and get signed, but that's the way the luck of the draw goes. So. Right. Well, and yeah, I was already and, in that band with Jimmy, so. And and now you've released the Club Wow album, and yeah. and it's yeah. a brilliant yeah. piece of Cleveland musical history. Yeah, and, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And and will live on, you know, as as that. And that's so then really the, cool. then there's a, on the Club Wow CD. There's there's a Club Wow playing at the Agora, and we're opening up for Lords of the Nature. So it all came kind of full circle. Full circle again. there. Yeah. yeah, and we would do gigs if they'd come here. So so, so after after the Dead Boys broke up and. The disconnected band broke up, and Stiv um, and Tragana was mm -hmm. the only one that he took from the Wanderers yeah, yeah. and put together with the Lords. When he moved over to England, did you guys stay in close touch? Oh yeah, we were to get. Well, I always stayed in touch with him. Yeah. So throughout the whole. Yeah, 80s, I got letters all over the place. I have to pull them out someday, read them again. Um, what um, <laughs> talking about Stiv and his jokes and things like that. Um. What's what's your favorite stiff prank? Because I'm sure that knowing him as long as you did, he must have pulled some real winners. My favorite though, was the well, I think the funniest thing he ever did that made me laugh hilariously, and Jimmy too, because he was there. But uh, the night we met the Stones at, at Keith Richards' birthday party, I told you earlier, Cheetah had Cheetah been in earlier wrist, and right. broke his wrist. So. So Anita Pallenberg invited us over, so uh, it was at the Roxy, Roxy Roller Disco in um, New York City. So we get in the cab, meet Zero and Stiv, we we'll walk in and, and Anita meets us at the door. She goes, come on, up this way. And they had rented this whole Roxy, Ro Roxy Roller Disco from the party. And as we walk in, there's Keith and um, Ronnie Wood. And uh, he's shaking his hand. It's, Keith is the coolest guy in the world. Yes, it's always one of my heroes where I talk to him. He goes, you're a cheetah, did it? And Jimmy goes, what? What did he do? He goes, he really did. He goes, he fell and broke his wrist. He goes, roller skiing is my driver. Took him to the hospital. <laughs> oh, Christ. So, so anyway, we go to the party and we're eating. And Keith's really hospitable. They had all this great food. We're eating the food. And they had a whole tub of um, imported beer, which we'd never seen before. Because you couldn't get that many imported beer. There was like Heineken back there. And that, Guinness, maybe. And that was about it. They had all this stuff. So we started drinking the beers and everything. And ate the food. And um, Mick Jagger was there. Big, big beer, you know. And you could, wouldn't even know it was him if you, because he was just in this guy's party in New York. And actually, that's the night uh, Keith met Patty Hansen, too. When she was at that party. And there was all these Rasta guys and, and uh, uh, Bobby Keys. And Mick's talking to one of the Rasta guys. I don't know if it was Peter Tosh or something. You could tell who it was. But they were in the middle of the room. And Mick's on roller skates. So he seems like real tall. He's like six foot four on these roller skates. And Stip's, you know, like five seven or whatever. So I see Stiv inching over to him, and I just hear, I said, we better go with him, he's going to do something. We hadn't met Mick yet. So um, uh, Stiv goes up to him from behind, taps him on the shoulder, and Mick turns around, the most condescending look I've ever seen in my life. And <laughs> Peter <laughs> says, where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I said, where's the bathroom at? <laughs> and it's kind of like silence with everybody around here. And Mick shakes his head and he goes, ah, don't go around the corner. <laughs> so we go in the bathroom we just fall up that laugh. And I said, Christ, Peters, I said, I can't believe you fucking did this. <laughs> and we're, we are, me and Jimmy have tears in our room. <laughs> it was one of the funniest, and even Stib, I knew how funny it was. It's just one of the funniest things I had ever seen in my life. Yeah. So even despite the beard, he knew that was Jagger. Oh and yeah, did it deliberately. He, he just, he <laughs> wasn't, he was just, just just to take the piss up. And you know, Jagger was his hero. Right. And, but that's just the way Stib was. He had to do something that night. Yeah. And we were never introduced. Him. You know, we talked to Keith and Mick, uh, um, and uh, Ronnie Wood quite a bit, but we hadn't been introduced to, to Mick. Yeah. That was the introduction to Mick. <laughs> but that's my funniest day. There's a lot of them, but that one takes the cake. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good one. Yeah. I mean, you know, the greatest rock and roll band <laughs> yeah. in the world, right? And, and, and there here's just, this 
Ask him where the snot kid coming up. Ask him where, ask the, bathroom him where the bathroom is. That's and, awesome. and, and Jagger kind of couldn't didn't know if the, the piss was being taken out or if he even knew who he was or. Oh, yeah, it, which is why I was just that's gonna why ask. He, he just didn't know. Yeah, you know? and it was the the, the perfect piss. Yeah, you know? uh -huh. and he's just spaders fucking around. Yeah. You know? So um, were were the stones like hip to what oh, was going yeah, on yeah. at that time? Yeah. Then, the funny thing is, we we would never. Jimmy and I, we could never tell that story because everybody would think we were full of shit, you know? Uh -huh. But then when Keith's book came out, it's like on one page, she goes, oh, Anita was always bringing interesting people around like the dead boys. So there it was. Then Keith finally, yeah, so yeah, we tell the story now. <laughs> yeah, I had, heard, in, I had heard a long time ago about this party, and, uh -huh. and I'm sitting here thinking, it's like, wow, you guys had a Keith Richards birthday party? Yeah. On roller skates, yeah. and it's like, what? This yeah. is crazy, and yeah. I couldn't figure. I yeah, couldn't we didn't picture. put in, we didn't put the roller skates on the. We would have broken our necks probably. But I yeah. couldn't picture Keith on skates, and no, I mentioned Keith, that to Keith, no, Keith didn't have skates. Yeah, I mentioned that to Cheetah last night, and that's what he said. He yeah. said, no, I. He said I was on skates, and he says I was probably drunk off my ass that night, and just yeah. one leg went this way, and the other yeah. leg went that way, yeah. and I went down and yeah, Keith broke wasn't my on skates, but Mick and, was. Mick was, yeah, and and, and Marlon was there, the young. <laughs> It was a crazy party. It was actually surrealistic. You, you walk in there, and, and, and Keith is like the coolest guy in the way. He just was, you know? Yeah. I've always said that out of all the rock stars and everybody, the only two people that fame never really affected, and they were always themselves, was Keith Richards and Paul McCartney. Everybody else got screwed up. <laughs> Dylan <laughs> Lennon, you know, Pete Towns, blah, you know? Right. But those two were always just the the coolest guys and to this day still are they just it doesn't affect them yeah that's great yeah so so obviously knowing Stiff for so long the two of you were real close you know all the touring together and all the playing together and everything else you were one of the first people that agreed to do the benefit that I held for his parents yeah, sure. in 1990 oh, yeah, yeah. and I'm really grateful for oh, that yeah. I wanted to thank that was you. that was a good night yeah I, I wanted to thank you publicly for yeah. that as well um so, um, and then the documentary benefit that we just held this mm -hmm. past year, yeah, yeah, and you did that, and I wanted to thank you oh, for that you're too. Welcome. That was I'm also glad very to do cool. it. You know, I loved Stib's family. I loved his mom and dad and him, and I'm glad to help out anyway. Yeah. yeah, and that was that was really great. So, um, so after the final breakup of the Dead Boys, um, then you got together and did the Club Wow thing, and that was around '82. How long did that last? Club Wild went from um, 1982 to 1985, and we, you know, we played one or two gigs a, a, a month, either around Cleveland, Akron, or Youngstown, or Buffalo, and then we, we were mainly trying to get uh, um, a recording contract. We finally got, had lots of uh, demos done, and we had a lot of labels interested in this. We went to New York and did a, a, a showcase at Trax, I think it was. And had a bunch of labels up, but no one signed us. Yeah, and it was just we just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, probably. And then they kind of just petered out after that. Everybody was, uh, you know, just I, fed up with yeah. it. Because I was going to say, yeah, you know, like with all that tired. star power yeah. in the band, you'd think that it would have the popularity that yeah, it would keep I, I, going. Yeah, I would have thought so too. But, but uh, you know, at least we had those recordings, and we all still remain great friends. Billy Sullivan needed to play out and make more money, so he was playing out with different bands. Jeff moved to New York to run all the uh, Ultrasound Studios, you know, which he's still up there now for the city. He's coming back to Cleveland. So, um, and then, you know, uh, Jimmy and I, we just kind of dr dr drifted apart. And uh, then they had the couple dead boys reunions after that, where the influence went on tour with him. But yeah, I never, never played with them again. So you did do a single, The Prettiest Girl mm -hmm. and The Nights Are So Long. Yes. Um, how did that do? Did that do but, fairly well? Uh, that, that, real, that was just like a local release and everything. Uh, that was actually done before I was in the band, you know. Okay. That was done at Kirk Pianos and, and Bob Kier and Kirk maybe produced that. And uh, yeah, and they had just put that out as, as I joined the band. Okay. Yeah. Was was Jimmy working on the lesbian maker thing at that time? Or did no, that no, that, that, was, came that was after, after, that was after, after yeah, the club yeah, yeah. broke yeah, up. That was a good band too. He had good stuff like that. So, um, was was there much talk? Or was there any talk of a reunion when you put out the Club Wow album? Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're still talking about it. It still might happen one of these days. You know, if we can get everybody together and do it, maybe we'll do a, you know 
Cleveland, Akron, and Youngstown. I think maybe a New York thing too. Because I don't that think Billy's in fun. town right now. Yeah, he? yeah, he's coming. Oh, well, he's coming. I know in November too. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of November, um, the Dead Boys are doing a show at the Rock Hall. Oh, okay. Um, at the Rock Hall Archives. Oh, okay. On November fourth. Oh, that's cool. So that'll yeah. be that'll be a really cool. Yeah, thing. that's nice. And, yeah, yeah, that's and great. I guess they're really excited about. Oh, doing that's real that cool. Too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's great. Um, I'm I'm guessing. Uh, well, you said in the liner notes on the CD um, that Club Wow was one of the favorite bands that you yeah, ever played. Yeah, Club in. Wow was a great band. Everybody in that band could really, really play. Mm -hmm. I mean, the timing was perfect. Great singers, you know. It was, you know, I, I only sang lead on one or two songs. That's how good the singers were. In that great band. personalities. Yeah, 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 everybody great personality. gelled yep, together. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's oh, we never had a bad word with each other. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. Everybody was good. So, so how did you get involved with the Infidels and producing their stuff? Well, I I I was um, uh, manager of National Record Mart up here in the mall, and this is about 1982 or 83. And uh, it, it's the weirdest thing about. You know, most guys that are in bands, and when you need money, you usually end up working in a music store or a record <laughs> store. Yeah. So, so I was. Got to stay close to the music, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I was. I had just started with Club Wow, and I was a manager up, up at the Record Mart. And these two scruffy look, looking punks come in and plop a, a, a disconnected album down in ten months. You know, it's John Lumick and Pete Terrier. They're from from the Debbie Poets and Pete owns the studio. And I said, you guys got to be some kind of sickos to buy crap like this, you know? You want that stuff's great. They're, 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 they're real upset that I'm fucking, uh, I said, shit, I said, oh, stiff's great. I said, turn the record over. Say, turn on, that's me. I said, look at it, look at it. How you doing? So, hey, we got a band, you want to come down and hear us? I said, geez, okay, you know? So they talked me to come down here. I said they had covered the last year that Stiv had died, and they were about 17 or 18, and they were not not that good, but they thought they were great. You know, they had a real good attitude. So I told, I said, I said, see what I could do. So my friend Jeff Jones was managed bands and everything. He was managing Club Wild too. So I said these kids, I said, I said that they got a real good attitude, charismatic kids, smart asses. I said, just picture you know. A, Stiv Bader's, Jim Kens, or Frank Sessage when they were 17. That's all of them. Yeah. He goes, Oh, should we manage them? And I said, Yeah, we should do this. So that's, I got them recorded, and then now, you know. That was the 4, the four by 20 album? Yeah, all that stuff. And then, uh, 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 yeah. What was it? Four. Intervals times four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so now, now I'm in the band with them, Debbie Boat. So, so funny how life works, you know? And the disconnected albums started it all. That, so you, but you never actually played with them as the end. No, no, I was their manager. I played on some of the records and stuff, and wrote a song or two. Before. So okay, um, so all right, let's bring it up to today, and okay. let's talk about the Debbie Poets and and how that whole thing came about, because that's another really great power pop punky garagey kind of band. But well, in, in 2005, um, Bomp Records got a hold of me. Susie Shaw, they were going to do a tribute to Greg Shaw after he had passed away. I don't know if I could get a bunch of Ohio people to um, play on it and do a song for this tribute album. So I, I got Dave Swanson and um, uh, Billy Sullivan. I got called one or two of the Rebels, but they couldn't make it. And uh, Blue Ash guys, Bill Bartlin and myself, Infidels, and uh, uh, we all we all got together and, 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 and played over at Pete's studio and did him or me the Paul Revere and Raiders song. And I thought, wow, this. And I produced it. And I said, this sounds so good. I, I said, if I ever get a band together. This is what I want to do, and I was starting to write songs again. I had quit quit for you know from 1990 to 2004. I had never even picked up a guitar. I had just quit playing. And uh, after uh, Stiv died, yeah, I imagine it took the wind out of the sails. And four days later, my other best friend, uh, uh, Beaver Warner, Mark Warner, uh, blew his brains out. And so I lost two two within a week. And uh, I was just I had had it with music. I had a three-year-old son, and I thought, well, I'm just gonna let it go. And um, never did play. So um, uh, 13 years later, I picked up my guitar one day and I played this really, really great riff. And I hadn't touched the guitar, 13 year old strings on it yet. And so I wrote the Stiv Bader's Ghost Tour song right on the spot, about 20 minutes. And then I went over and talked to Pete and recorded it just acoustically. And, and another friend of mine, Tom Saylor, let me come over and record some stuff. So I had about a half dozen songs. 
So well, anyway, back to the, the thing for Bob. Uh, I said, if I ever get a band together, I'd like to do this. So I uh, started thinking about it. And then uh, um, I said, if I do get a band, I'll get Terry Hartman in it. You know, a friend. Well, he had disappeared just like me, but his son had been recording over at Pete's. So uh, we got together with Terry, and I said, you know, let's come and record some stuff. And we recorded a couple songs. sounded great. And um, uh, I had sent my, my demos and everything out to different people. And uh, sent him to Bob, and uh, uh, Patrick Bussell, who's there now, runs uh, Alive Records and Bob with Susie. He goes, I can't do anything with this. It's not the kind of thing I'm using, but I know this label over in Japan. They go crazy over this vivid sound. So I sent a uh, couple of uh, uh, MP3s out. And Twelve hours later, they offered me a recording contract. So <laughs> after all those years trying to get stuff, it takes mm -hmm. that easy. I get another one. So we just started recording. They sent us in advance, recorded the first album, and we're working on our ninth album now. Ninth album? Yeah, ninth, ninth Debbie Poets album. Wow. So, so that's how that all started. And Terry left the band a couple years ago in 2015. We got John Lumick then from uh, uh, The Infidels. So uh, he's a great songwriter. So we're working and working. I keep, we've toured Europe three times. Um, They're real popular over there. Does that translate into similar popularity here in the States? No, or is no, it just not a much here, but, thing? but we have a popularity in the States for another reason. It's because of Little Steven. You know, we've had Underground three, Garage. three songs on the inter Underground Garage, and that has like 5 million listeners a week. It's on 300 stations syndicated. And then we're on Sirius Radio. They play us every day on, there, mm -hmm. on that thing, so people know who the Deadly Poets are. So... It's been so What's the new Blue Ash stuff like? Is it like the Poets, or is it more like Blue Ash? Is there a distinction? It, 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 it's, it's like Blue Ash with the Poets backing them up. <laughs> I'll play you a couple things. We'll go in. They're just rough cuts, but I think you'll get the idea when we go back in. It's kind of pretty cool. Okay. And lastly, um, tell us about the tour with the Roomful of Strangers. Um, since they're based out of Florida, yeah. how did you hook up with them? Well, and... Mick, Mick, Mick McLuhan, who, who's the lead singer, he's originally from Youngstown. Okay. So he'd be back here visiting his mom and everything, and he came to see me at the, at the, uh, the Debbie Poets at um, Cedars. And we, we became friends, and he goes, you know, I, I have this, you know, run this company, Bread and Circuses, and uh, we book bands, and we do this, I have the band, and all. He's, he's in all kind of things, they produce things, he has a whole company and stuff. So um, I've done like three tours with them. I go out and acoustically for my book. I play an acoustic set. Then I get up and do Johnny Sincere and the Stiff Baders Ghost Tour and a few other ones. They've just recorded that and they're putting that out as a single, the Baders Ghost Tour. They do a great job on it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention that the the yeah. whole thing about and and that's uh, since you mentioned that you you know do mm -hmm. the, the yeah. solo thing ahead of time. Um, one of the cool things I think when you do your solo material. Um, acoustically like that, you always tell the story oh, yeah. of how the song was oh, yeah, was yeah, made, yeah. and it seems like just about every song has to do with somebody or something that crossed your path yeah, at some yeah, point usually. during your life, and I think that's a really cool way to approach oh, it. Because oh, thanks. I always, I always, I always take the approach toward music. If if you can write something that's true to you, you, you know it. It, it'll it'll transfer that way, but a lot of times, as as a writer, it's hard to see the things that are right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And when you can see the things that are in front of your face, like people you know or things like that, and it, it, it's been there all the time. Like I wrote a song called Jenny Bird Hill. I'll take it back. And people really like one of the most popular things. But I would drive past it every day of my life and never think about it. And all of a sudden, it hit me one day. All the memories of that place. Yeah. It's just how I work. <laughs> and and stories about all of that stuff can be found in Circumstantial Evidence. Circumstantial Evidence, my book. From yes. High Voltage uh, Publishing out of Australia. Uh, you can get it at all um, bookstores everywhere. But the best place is to get them because a lot of them are autographed and things like that, if you're into that. Or uh, get hip out of Pittsburgh. and uh, That shows, obviously. It, yeah, yeah. And and Bomb, Bomb carries them, of course, and have them. So that's that's great. Good, good sales. Yeah, good sales. Steady sales. It just keeps going and going and going, which is nice, you know. Is there going to be another pressing or another uh, publication run? Um, I'm talking to people right now in Spain about doing it in, in Spanish. 
and maybe using different pictures and stuff because I have all those pictures of mm -hmm. those girls gave me. So maybe there'll be a Spanish version. I have a lot of fans in, in uh, Mexico and South America and especially in Spain, so it'll be. Why do you think you're so big in the Latin countries? I have no idea. <laughs> and they're so cool too, you know. I'm walking down the street and one guy goes, Frank Sausage gives me a big hug down the street in Madrid. You are the master of the world. And I'm thinking, where is this? <laughs> But that's how crazy it is. And we would be playing, you play on a Tuesday night and there's 400 people in the club and everybody's singing Blue Ash songs. This is, this is nuts. You know? Yeah. And you just see everybody mouthing, you know, it's plain to see. Yeah. And, and, and to bring it full circle, one of your Spanish friends turned you on to this Venezuelan yeah, I, version of a Blue Ash song. Yeah, I had never seen it before and I was looked, I just check every once in a while to see things rotten and, and I look on Discogs and it says Venezuela pressing and has pictures of it and the label and it's in Spanish and everything. Wow, so I put it up and I goes, I have that. That's where I first heard Blue Ash and I saw it. I'll send him an English version. He says, I'll send it to you if you guys just send me an English one. I said, great. So, <laughs> never knew it was in Venezuela. <laughs> it's just things like it just you don't know, you know? Yeah. And it always just makes it so great when you find oh, it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Just there there Somebody at some company there, yeah, licensed it from CBS or Playboy, and, or were part of their umbrella or something. They just put it out. You, you just never know. Always nice to know you're more popular than you ever thought you were. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you, you know, I mean, I, I still get, I'll get calls in in the middle of the night that I'm so and so from Brisbane, Australia. How did you get that guitar sound? <laughs> I go, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I, I like it. I dig it, though. It's fun. I mean, what, what can you ask for? You know. Yes. That's yeah, that's more, great. Yeah, it's just fun that people still think so much of it, especially the disconnected. I might get more mail and emails and stuff like that every day. But I spend two hours a day just answering, you know, emails, messages on people. So a lot of fans like to talk. I'll talk to them. Yeah. You know? That's great. It it's, was always like that. He never forgot anyone's name. Right. He was, you know, he was. Yeah. He never did. He would forget a name, face. Yeah. So that's great. And and you know, it's like it's quality material. It keeps going. Mm -hmm. It'll keep you going. You keep going. Yeah. And, I'm 66 years old now. I can't complain. Yeah. And that's yeah. <laughs> what more can be said. Yeah. Frank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Appreciate. It. Thanks.